734 p.m. It is Thursday, May 13th, 2021. Call this meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals to order. Um, good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Kevin Mills. Here. Aaron Here. Ford. And Stephen Here. Redmond. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. O'Rourke is unfortunately not available this evening. Um, on behalf of the town, uh, Rick Valerelli will be joining us later on. Uh, Vincent Lee is here um, to help us out. And uh, Jennifer Rate is here from the Department of Planning and Community Development. Here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, outside uh, consultants, uh, we have Paul Haverty. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you. Uh, and Marty Nover on behalf of Beta Group. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. I see several members of your staff are here. Yes, um, Bill McGrath and um, Greg Lucas. Perfect. Hello. Good evening. Um, and then on behalf of the applicant, uh, Stephanie Keeper. Good evening. Good to see you. And there's a... And we have, I think, the full suite here. So we have John Hessian, um, Gwen Noyes, and, and Art Klipfell, of course. Um, we have Scott Thornton, and then we have, I think, I'm not certain I see him yet, but Scott Vlasic from Bruce Hamilton. Okay. Should be on. So, and, and Bob Angler. Sorry. Okay, so I thought I saw Bob, yeah. Yeah. And uh, maybe I haven't seen Scott yet. Vlasic. Oh, there he is. Hello. Yeah. And I, I'm not certain, but is Kyle joining this evening as well, or just you, Scott? You're on mute. Yes, Kyle is here as well. No, perfect. Okay. And Kyle will. Thank you. So good evening. This open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. The order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access is listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Other participants are participating by computer audio or telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask that you please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. So I don't let a few people in. <clears throat> so turning to the comprehensive permit hearing for Thorn Thorndike Place, I'd like to review some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. So at the April 20th hearing, the applicant requested additional time to prepare design drawings showing duplex buildings on Dorothy Road, the multifamily building behind for public review. The revised drawings were submitted on Monday, May 10th and posted to the agenda for this meeting. This evening's discussion will focus on this new proposal from the applicant. We'll open with a presentation by the applicant followed by questions from the board. After the board members, after the board, members of the public will be invited to to provide their questions and comments. So with that, um, <clears throat> I'd like to turn it over to uh, Ms. Kiefer. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, as um, the chairman just stated at the last hearing, um, the board had asked the applicant to consider um, a, a design that would reintroduce the duplex units along Dorothy Road that had been part of the original project proposal. Um, and so we kind of went back, took a look at things, took a serious look at things, 
Um, and uh, what we have created is a, is a revised concept that we're pleased to present to the board this evening. Um, and so the, the, the team is gonna present it more, but I'm just going to give a quick overview um, of, of the revised concept. And we're, we're excited about this. We think that it's consistent with a lot of the feedback that we've heard from the board and from the public over the past months. And, and we've um, taken that seriously in providing um, this, this concept that we're presenting this evening. And so with that being said, I just wanted to highlight a few points and then that um, we'll get into how it, how it plays out on the site. You can um, get a view of it. But um, as the board had requested, we went back and looked to see whether the six townhomes could be reintroduced along Dorothy Road. And um, what we are proposing is to reintroduce those townhomes. Um, and likewise, consistent with comments that had been made, they would be ownership units. So they would still be subject to 40B. So what that means is of the six duplex buildings, 12 units, 25% um, of those would be ownership to persons at, at low and moderate income levels. And, and those would be subject to, as we've discussed before, um, a deed rider that continues on that affordability um, into the future. And then the, um, the, the changes then that kind of like in part and parcel flowed from that was the apartment building that we had on the, on the project site, um, as you recall that we had those three tabs that were right on Dorothy Road. So we would need to pull that farther back from Dorothy Road, obviously to make room for the townhomes. Um, in doing that, we also took into account, well, what other improvements can we make or how other, in what other ways can we address what we've been hearing in these public hearings? Um, and so we have reduced the size of the building. So the footprint of the building has been reduced. Um, and likewise, in addition to pulling it back from Dorothy Road, it's stepped back further in, in certain places. So the closest portion of the apartment building part of the project to Dorothy Road is about 103 feet. And then back from there, you have another um, kind of the, the Western portion swings back even farther, 145 feet. Um, and there's a little tab that's even 171 feet from Dorothy Road. Um, and, and just to give the board some sort of context as to what those numbers mean, a lot of times a standard lot length is 100 feet. So we're talking, it's almost like a back lot, if you will. Um, and then part and parcel with that, um, the size, the footprint of the building is reduced, but also um, we're proposing a different program for it. So it would be senior housing and that would be assisted and independent living, a, a mix. 126 units total. Um, and as I pointed out, I think in my cover letter with the concept plans that we submitted, um, that's consistent with master plan, um, page 88 of the master plan that referenced the need for um, the, the aging population of Arlington and that there would be a shortage in the future of that. And we think that that addresses it um, specifically two ways. One, by keeping it a rental you have the ability for Arlington residents to somewhat age in place, right? So you have somebody coming into an independent living and then as their needs progress, you know, in, in years to come, they may need to move to the assisted living side. And so there they stay within the same community. They, you know, they keep that community, not only to their family in the Arlington area, but within the community of an assisted living facility, independent living facility. I'm, I'm sure a lot of us have family members that are in these and, it is important to keep that community as, as people age. Um, and then in addition to providing that need, um, the revised program also responds to the concerns about the amount of parking on the site. Um, assisted and independent living um, tends to generate less traffic and therefore the needs for parking are greatly reduced. And so consistent with, and Scott Thornton's here to, to explain how the ITE um, parking scenario works out, but um, the, the, the overall parking count would be uh, 96 units, 80, 86 of which are underground, or maybe 95, maybe off by one, 95 or 96. Um, 85 within the surface parking or within the garage parking, and then only 10 surface parking spaces. So it greatly reduces that um, and another benefit of reducing the impervious surface 
is also the western side of the property. Um, it becomes available open space. So what we had that western surface lot and the children's play lot, that would now be available for um, green open space gardens lawns um, that that type of things. And I, th I think that I'm probably getting into too much detail that will be helpful for you to look at them with, with the plans being shown. But what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to ask Scott if he could just pull up, um, we had provided um, kind of a, a progression plan or a progression chart. So the board could see how Thorndike Place has kind of changed um, in the course of these public hearings. And I think it's helpful before we get into the plan. So. Uh, Scott Vlasic, if, if he could be allowed to share his screen. <clears throat> ben, can you go ahead and do that? I'm just, um, Mr. Chairman, I'm just waiting for the, I think that someone's probably doing it, disabling the, um, so that I can share my screen. Right now the host has disabled it. Okay. This is usually the, the part that um, <clears throat> that Rick takes care of. So. Yeah, uh, Scott, if I make you temporarily a co-host, can you do that? Sure. All right. Whatever you do, don't log off. Yes, well. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> it's only the co-host, so yeah, we won't do that. Uh, I'll take it very, very seriously. We, we accidentally uh, had that happen one night, so. <laughs> OK. So uh, is everyone seeing, Stephanie, are you seeing what you want to see right now? Yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. So just to kind of walk the board through the submittal, it has um, basically like six kind of metrics on the side. And then um, the first column, the original proposal, that's what um, had, had been presented with the original application and had, had been part of the, the program through um, you know, like mid 2020. Um, and then the middle column is when it was revised for multifamily only, and it was originally 176, and then um, we had recently pared that down to 172. And so the, the concept plan that we're presenting this evening um, is, is the column on the far right. So just to walk the board through, in terms of unit size, uh, Thorndike Place had started out at 219 total units. 12 of them were going to be the duplexes on Dorothy Road with 207 multifamily apartment building behind that. And then the revised project that we've been reviewing since fall of 2020, roughly, um, was pared down to just the multifamily. And, Can everybody get up? And it was ultimately um, reduced down to 172. Now, the current proposal that we're presenting this evening, it's a total of 138 units. 12 of those would be the duplex style fronting on Dorothy Road, so six buildings. Um, and behind it, 126 unit senior living assisted independent lift floor building. Um, in terms of affordability, the percentage, 25% affordability remains the same. Um, the, the, the difference now is that obviously um, from the 172 multifamily project is that within the affordability um, there will be 25% affordability of ownership units. So that will be three ownership units. And then for the assisted living, um, that's 32 for the senior living. Um, one of the largest changes is the amount of parking that would be required for the projects. Originally, when we had the townhouses and the, and the larger, much larger multifamily building, it was 309 parking spaces and 178 of those were garage, 131 surface. The last iteration of the plan that we've been discussing um, had 178 garage and 15 surface. And then the plan that's being presented this evening is a total of 96 parking spaces, 86 garage and 10 surface parking spaces. Um, the layout of, of the project, again, as I said, the original project <laughs> had those townhomes on Dorothy and then it had the two wings of multifamily building. Um, the 172, unit just had those three front tabs going towards Dorothy, the long spine that was about 415 feet in length. Um, and then <clears throat> some tabs going off to the rear and the closest portion of that multifamily building was 25 feet off of Dorothy Road. 
Here with the reintroduction in the plan we're presenting this evening, we see those duplex homes come back in. Um, they're right on Dorothy Road. They're with, um, they, they present that neighborhood feel that we've heard was important to the board and to the neighbors. Um, and then in addition to providing that feel, they also help provide a buffer for the, for the senior living apartment building that's gonna be behind that. And that apartment building has been moved farther back off of Dorothy Road. So not only do we have now a buffer, but we also have a reduced distance from the apartment building, which, which helps with the um, massing and scale. And then in terms of um, groundwater and floodplain design, um, the, uh, the garage in the 172 multifamily was at elevation 283 and the first floor is at elevation 13. And I think that uh, John will probably walk you through this, but here we have the garage level. We raised it up, so it's gonna be at elevation six. So it's gonna be above the water table sidedly. Um, and the first floor elevation um, for the senior living is gonna be at elevation 16. The duplex townhomes closer to Dorothy Road, they're gonna be at elevation 12. And there is gonna be no underground garage parking. Um, instead, as you'll see on the plans, there's just driveway and then there's a carport between the two. <clears throat> Um, and then lastly, um, just the open space amenities. And um, the, uh, as, as I mentioned before, uh, the prior design had the, the children's play lot and then it had those courtyards in, in the rear and then a courtyard in the front. Here, the revised design, because the footprint of the, of the um, senior living is smaller and the parking requirements are much reduced, we have the ability to take and just really make that whole western side really nice open space we can have gardens you know we're presenting concepts here as to what is possible um but you know we anticipate gardens lawn benches um and then we also have a courtyard to the rear of the building but likewise even when you um, enter the property and you're going into the um multi or pardon me the uh, the senior living like the drop-off area um it's going to be tree lined, so it's going to be like a a, a little boulevard to for guests and, and visitors to drop off family or to visit them. Um, it, the plan has much more open space amenities um, than the prior design had. So with that said, I am going to turn this over now to I think Gwen, um, who is going to uh, present kind of the, the overall with a, with a visual of a, of, a, of a sketch plan of what we have, what we're proposing here this evening. And Gwen, are you there? She's there, she's on mute. Oh. Can I? Can you hear me? We can. Oh. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you very much for, for your uh, time this evening. Um, and we're very pleased to be bringing you uh, a proposal that is responding, as Stephanie has mentioned, to the uh, requests that we've heard recently. Um, I'm going to take you on a little tour of the site plan. This is a bird's eye view, uh, starting along Dorothy Road. Um, uh, and as you, as you can see, there are six townhouses that are, or duplexes uh, there. You can also see that the size of these houses is, is actually smaller than the houses across the street. We don't have pictures here of that of them, but but if you compare the size of the square of, a, of the duplexes, then, then they, you'll see that they are uh, very much um, uh, in appropriate scale, even smaller. Um, each, each of the townhouses has a little yard in, in front of the, the building, uh, their, their homes. Um, we have uh, driveways that allow um, access to a, a carport or garage. We haven't decided exactly about that, but there's room for a, one car in, in, the, uh, in the garage and one car on the driveway. Um, and this is the, the elevation of this driveway is 11 feet. So uh, it, it's not a, um, in danger of flooding. Um, 
the car, let's see, there's a bit of a backyard that's also uh, on the side where the uh, uh, assisted living is, but it's a private little backyard. And uh, actually there's a roof deck also. So we're trying to give some outside amenity to all these townhouses. They're built to have three bedrooms plus a den. Uh, and they probably will have a garage, uh, a basement, but it's not necessarily the whole house. And it certainly is not uh, vulnerable for flooding because there would be no, uh, no way into it that would be uh, below uh, like 12 feet, a 12 foot elevation. Um, so then what I'm gonna do is take you down Dorothy Road uh, to the entrance of where uh, the new project would be, the, the assisted living. As you can see, we uh, are showing a buffer planting area between the, the property line and the, uh, uh, you know, and the house next door. So there'd be, you know, good room for, for uh, a screen there. And um, as Stephanie mentioned, this area was originally in the, or in the last plan uh, designated to be a parking area and, um, the, and there was going to be a playground there also. So what we've, we're showing here is um, sort of a, a variety of uses that could be put in uh, and this is not necessarily uh, the end plan, but I just wanted to indicate that there could be little garden plots that people, I, I know elders like to grow some veggies and flowers and so on. There could be a lawn that uh, I imagine family gatherings in the summer could be out there. I've, there's a little gazebo idea there, just, just to sort of think about the things that would be pleasant there. The uh, sun would be going down in the west, so this is a sunny, and and uh, you could be there out there for sunsets and you know, you know, family gatherings. Um, and then there, the it's also you know a place where there could be just a quiet flower garden kind of meditative space too. Um, we're showing, by the way, four parking spaces that are adjacent to this, so that um, if someone wanted to meet their family member in the garden, rather than having them come all the way to the entry, they, that's a possibility too. So continuing uh, from the, the driveway, entry drive, uh, the, the a left turn into the, uh, the sort of LA, the tree line uh, drive that would go up to the entry of the facility um, is, uh, this is where the entry will be, the cursor's on the entry. Um, there is guest parking uh, on the way in, and um, uh, this drawing is showing it angled, but uh, it's been, uh, uh, I've been reminded by our skillful en uh, engineer, John, that it would be much better to have it be just 90 degree parking, because then you can go in either going in or out um, um, any direction. Uh, this is also where deliveries and uh, any kind of uh, move-in movers or, or, or for that matter, trash removal, all that would be uh, off to the side. So going back out the drive um, to the, down to the entry to the garage, this is, as Stephanie pointed out, now at elevation six. And uh, we would be needing to house fewer cars. We have, I think it was uh, 86 um, cars that would need to go into the garage. Um, so <coughs> that would include staff as well as residents. And um, it would be secure, obviously, and it's uh, at a good, good elevation at this point. Um, as this is a bird's eye view, we have just a little indication that, that there would be, could be solar panels on the roof, as well as it can be a blue roof with water retention. This is depending upon our studies. And there would be obviously a few things like the um, compressors for, for the uh, heat pumps. Uh, all this is a reminder that this would be a very energy efficient green building, probably all electric. Um, and that's 
you know, something that, that we, we pay a particular amount of attention to. Okay, going out of the garage um, onto uh, the fire, there's a fire road and walking path. The fire road, uh, you will note, is in the same place as it was in the earlier design. Um, the footprint for the building is largely the same as, as um, there's just minor changes, but it, um, from in, in uh, regard to all the, the wetland considerations and aura and setbacks for floodplain and so on, there are very uh, minimal, minimal tweaks that have happened. So um, we, didn't, we don't want to go back and <laughs> do a lot of re-engineering, uh, but this path will allow a, a nice walk around the building as well as be a fire um, uh, road. Um, and I'm going to point out that we, we have a note on the bottom of the, of the drawing saying woodland restoration. Um, the property uh, line has not been drawn yet, but uh, the, the idea is that uh, the very first attention to um, re restoration of the, of the landscape so that it includes uh, native planting and, um, and does a, is a cool kind of demonstration cleanup that could be done along with the uh, early development of the property uh, with the optimistic notion that this will actually happen. Um, let's see, I think the, uh, just to mention that that whole aspect of the of the uh, plan is something that we really uh, look forward to participating in some negotiations on how best to to uh, restore the land. So um, I think there's uh, something else that if there's anything else that I am forgetting, Stephanie will remind me. Um, <laughs> And with that, um, I'm going to suggest we go to the next slide, which shows the, the, what happens with all, all this work that, that uh, has, has gone on. We, we show the, that the scale of the new town uh, du duplex uh, buildings are, are in, you know, similar to what uh, is going on across the street, and they function as screens to the, um, the building behind. Um, we would be planting trees along the street and a screen uh, between our neighbor and, and our building. Um, you know, if, were this to happen, we would be negotiating, uh, you know, working out some favorable uh, ways for for either fences or planting with our with the neighbors on either end of the property. Um, so this is showing the streetscape, and I'm told that the width of the road is precisely what's on the plans for uh, Arlington. Um, it's an accurate <laughs> drawing, and um, it shows uh, you know some trees, the new tree plant, uh, trees along the street, and this is a seven year growth. It's not, we would not be putting in large trees at, at the very beginning, but they would grow shortly. Um, and uh, we have a slight variation in the plans between uh, the, the duplexes so that there's, it isn't like the exact same shoulders, soldiers going down the, uh, the road. So um, I think with this, uh, it, uh, Scott Vlasic was going to continue. Um, oh, it's you? Okay, Scott Vlasic and, and Arthur are going to, uh, Arthur Klipfel, um, we're, is going to, they're go two of them are going to uh, proceed with the, the following drawings. So, so Scott, uh, why don't you start off? Thank you, everybody, for joining. Sure. Um, so thank you, Gwen. Um, I think that was a really uh, good overview of the site plan. Um, as Gwen was just mentioning, uh, the townhouses, um, you know, along the road here, um, we really are making an effort to use uh, residential forms, uh, residential vocabulary that will um, fit into the neighborhood. 
um, trying to break up the, um, the facades with, uh, as you can see here, various trims, overhangs, uh, fenestration, and different color accent siding so that, um, so that these units, uh, as Gwen was saying, won't appear um, very repetitive. Although the, the units inside, um, we imagine the floor plans will be um, very similar as duplexes. Um, you can see the way we're treating the landscaping here, even though it's, it is difficult to see, as Gwen was mentioning, there is uh, quite a bit of landscaping along the road, which will further help to kind of give, you know, a nice streetscape presentation. Um, and as well, uh, you can see how uh, plantings along the property lines here will further serve to uh, screen the uh, four-story building behind. So um, with that being said, Art, was there anything that you wanted to add on this particular? Well, you might just mention that the townhouses themselves are sort of typical in the neighborhood. They're two and a half stories. There's uh, one bedroom upstairs and then uh, two bedrooms and a study on the second floor and one living dining kitchen on the first floor. And I, I guess obviously each of the uh, duplexes, so each building that we're seeing there has two, two separate units in it, or two, two completely separate entrances. Yep. Yeah, good, good point. So if we kind of zoom in on one here, you can imagine there's a dividing wall pretty much uh, down the middle here. And as Gwen was mentioning in her presentation, here's just a glimpse of uh, the back deck, which actually happens on the, um, on the third level. Um, so that's uh, you know, a nice outdoor amenity for- You point uh, out the actual entrance there to the each unit's uh, little stairway. Sure, we really zoom in. The main entrance is right here with a little bit of an overhang, um, kind of on the side, similar to some of the other duplexes that are along Dorothy Road now. Good. Okay, so um, the next slide that we have, um, I'll try to go through these fairly quickly. Um, I think the perspective tells most of the story, but we felt it was important to show this slide, which is really uh, at the top here, a uh, you know two-dimensional straight-on view of the six townhouses. Um, you can see, um, you know, faded. Um, Back in the background would be the uh, multi-family or the um, excuse me the um, senior uh, apartment building, and uh, as Stephanie mentioned, that is um, you know set back from the road and screened by the townhouses. Not only the townhouses, uh, the duplexes themselves, but the landscaping that goes along with them. And here we're giving you at the bottom a little bit more of an enlarged view, so that you can get a better sense of some of the features that Gwen was mentioning. Um, for example, two side by side here, you can see how the architecture is uh, buried on the uh, the north facade facing Dorothy Road. You can see the um, what's shown here as carports. Um, as Gwen mentioned, there could possibly be the, the option to enclose those as garages, but in this view, they're shown as open on the front and open on the back. Uh, so they'd be open air carports. Um, the landscaping that's in front of each unit would not only be along Dorothy Road, as was shown on, on the site plan, but um, also dividing uh, so that each of these yards will have, um, you know, more or less a private uh, front yard that, um, that belongs to that, that particular unit. Um, Art, anything to add on, on this slide? No, I think that was good, Scott, thank you. Okay. The next slide we have is um, uh, just an individual, um, elevation of each uh, duplex to just give you an idea of some of the uh, sidings that we're proposing. So it's a little bit more of a technical drawing, but um, uh, you know, quickly to review, I think some of the materials would be, um, you know, uh, cementitious siding or, or similar types of um, siding that would be designed to be uh, low or no maintenance. Um, Again, using different colors and different uh, textures and patterns to break up the, uh, the facade so that it's not, uh, not so repetitive. So we have uh, what we're calling the duplex A elevation here and uh, the, the variation on that, which would be a, an option B. Um, and we'd be mixing these up as you saw in the perspective and maybe even mirror imaging some of them as they um, continue along Dorothy Road. 
So the next slide we have is a section, um, a site section. So uh, to orient uh, folks here, this is Dorothy Road here. Um, I'll zoom in in a minute here so that you can see, but just to give you the overall view, this would be um, uh, a house across the street from um, our development, Dorothy Road here. This is a townhouse, uh, so excuse me, <laughs> duplex building here. Um, as Stephanie was mentioning, this um, uh, portion of the building, this is taken where this solid green portion of the um, senior building is 103 feet from uh, from the road. Um, so, you know, 20 feet for the setback here, um, 40 feet here, and 43 feet here. That's to the closest point. Um, it's actually this furthest point back is 145 feet. Um, so in this view, if I zoom in a little bit more here, um, you can see where, so we're cutting this section as if we're slicing through Dorothy Road and we're looking toward the east. So uh, as Gwen mentioned in her presentation, this right here is actually the entrance to the, um, the four-story building. So you would pull up in that um, kind of turnaround area that Gwen had showed you and this would be, uh, you know, probably some sort of canopy here with the main entrance. Um, there'd be then, you know, some area of uh, some amount of landscaping here, um, sloping down to the backyards of the uh, duplex units to give them a little uh, outdoor backyard space, as Gwen was mentioning. Um, and then another aspect of this diagram is you can see out at Dorothy Road, um, the uh, scale figures here and the car are provided so that you can see if someone was kind of walking along Dorothy Road and looking up um, at a point where they're standing actually in front of one of these duplexes, that duplex would be completely shielding uh, the four-story building from view. Um, you know, so the only places really you'd be seeing the four-story building is in a at a distance uh, when you're, of course, looking between um, these duplex buildings. Um, so, uh, so again, the, the idea here is that the, um, the four-story portion of the building, uh, as Gwen had mentioned, um, the tabs uh, that came out toward Dorothy Road have been removed in this scheme, and therefore the four-story portion of the building, um, if you can picture this point right here, um, is much further back in this scheme. Um, I believe the building went to uh, the four-story portion of the building in the previous scheme um, started much closer to Dorothy Road. Um, so that's another um, uh, aspect to this design that you can see in this uh, site section diagram. Um, I think, uh, Scott, there's a little bit further back. The, uh, the, the nearest light green is 103 feet. That's yeah, correct. Mark Green is back. What do I have here? I have notes. <laughs> Unfair, but 145. 145. 171. So that's, I think you've got those dimensions, don't you, and plan uh, further on in this presentation, Scott? Yes. Yep, that's true. We can, so we can point those out, and it, it probably will be, make a lot more sense once we get to that slide. You will be able to review those again uh, in the plan view. Um, so again, just um, to review some other aspects that Gwen had covered, uh, here's the garage level, um, you know, raised up from, we, essentially the whole building has been picked up to raise the, um, the garage level from the 2.83 to elevation six. Above that is the, um, four stories of residential. Above that, um, on the townhouse here, you can see uh, what Art was describing, two full floors um, of living space. And then a third level, which is kind of uh, maybe considered a half story. Um, it's not a it's not a full story up there, but there is enough room to have living space and bedroom um, up on that third floor. Option for um, basements um, below the townhouses. Uh, excuse me, I keep saying townhouse. I'm meaning to say duplex. Um, as Gwen had mentioned, these would be um, optional uh, and most likely not living space, just um, utilized for storage. Um, so with that being said, I went into a lot of detail on that slide. Um, the, the next slide that we have is a, a similar section. This is cut at a point where the, um, again, the solid green is indicating I'm actually slicing through the building 
um, this is at the point where the building is 103 feet from Dorothy Road. And um, you see the similar, uh, this is the style B townhouse and you can see that similar effect with the sight line um, from Dorothy Road. Um, all right, anything to add on, on those sections? No, I think that's good, Scott. Okay, great. Um, so this brings us to the uh, ground floor plan. And um, uh, Art, would you like to uh, describe this or you want me yeah, to this is going? a uh, obviously just a diagram. Uh, Gwen and I have both done uh, two or three different uh, assisted living buildings and independent living buildings. Uh, one in Dorchester and one in Cambridge. Uh, the, we were developer and architect. And so what we have here is a diagram. The, the light color is, uh, is uh, which could be rearranged. Uh, it's kind of the entry level stuff, different offices and there's a workout room and a, uh, exercise, a common community room, which is on the balcony. The yellow, I think is one of the most interesting things. It's a 62 foot by 13 foot porch. Uh, I spent some time in Michigan growing up and I always was fascinated by the Mackinac Island porch. It's the biggest porch in the world, supposedly. I don't know if anybody knows that, uh, has ever been there. But anyhow, it's, it's a magnificent porch and I kind of had that in mind as we added this thing. It's, great. it's the south side, sunny side, and I think it would be uh, much enjoyed. And uh, one other thing, the light green, just as a diagram again, uh, is the uh, support space. Uh, we're certainly on the one side would be uh, a kitchen and a dining area next to the porch. So that would be the assisted living side. The other side, the independent living side might be a card room and things like that. Offices uh, specialized in independent living, uh, but it's not yet designed. Now we have one of the facilities we designed years ago, Glenn and me, uh, was, uh, um, organized run by a fellow named Bob Larkin and um, very, very uh, great manager. And he's moved on to higher levels now and uh, operates a fairly large yeah. business, senior mm -hmm. living residences. And he's uh, not necessarily designated here yet by any means, as you know, we're just starting. But he's been a consultant on this. And um, one of the things about laying these out is you need somebody with some real expertise to tell you how to do that. And we'd be looking to Bob to uh, help us on that. And he's, uh, he's uh, indicated a willingness to do that. And uh, uh, we certainly think he has the skill set to, to make a wonderful uh, community. Anything to add to that, Scott? No, great, great job um, walking through that. I think, you know, one thing maybe I should mention is, so which didn't come up yet, is that the uh, delivery would be just to the upper side there. I, so I did. And I guess when I mentioned that, and then there would be a truck dock, and you can see how that's next to a trash room. And uh, that would be also a uh, delivery area. We don't have that very well detailed yet, but there'd be a, a separate room there for delivery of uh, groceries and things like that that would then be taken over to the kitchen. So it's not yet, you know, taken apart. Big mail room, big lobby. Yep, excellent. Um, so ready to move on to the garage plan? Art? If I could just jump in with, with one quick point, Art, that you might want to point out. Um, so, so you see that the, the, the footprint is 32,708 square feet. And uh, maybe you could just give um, our information as to how we've determined 126 units, how, how that's calculated. Yeah, we uh, again consulted with uh, with Bob Arkin on this, and uh, it it turns out that the number of uh, residential units in a multifamily building uh, is approximately the same as the number of units in a uh, uh, independent living and assisted living facility, and that's because the units are smaller, but the common areas are larger. And the guidelines in the industry are just that, that uh, if you had 126 uh, residential units laid out, one and two bedrooms, uh, that that's about the same number of assisted living and independent living units that you'd have in the same floor space. Uh, so that's how we arrived at the 126 units. This isn't laid out in detail yet, as you can see, but we're uh, very confident in, uh, in Bob's uh, 
uh, development of those numbers. So there'd be studio units, there'd be one bedroom units in the assisted living side, and there'd be mainly ones and uh, occasional twos in the uh, independent living side. And there, there could be some memory units here. That's another thing that uh, is part of uh, Bob's program. And they tend to be the same size with the assisted living. And again, we've worked on the, as the designer of, uh, of two of these facilities. And um, so we feel, uh, uh, you know, that it's kind of be very interesting to go back and do that. Uh, so we just move forward. Might move in. Might move in, yeah. <laughs> Never know. So I think we're good, Scott. Let's go. Okay, very good. So that brings us to the plan of the garage um, level, as I think both um, Stephanie and Gwen mentioned, there are 86 uh, parking spaces inside the garage, um, 10 surface spaces that are shown on the on the site plan, as Gwen had uh, pointed out, for a total of 96 spaces. Um, as Gwen had mentioned, there's a main entrance to the garage here for, uh, for vehicles. Um, and, and very similar, uh, most other aspects of this to the um, previous plan, where there's, of course, access to elevators and circulation. Um, there's probably some um, some mechanical uh, space down here, um, you know, and, and uh, considerations for accessible parking placed uh, as close as possible to the um, uh, to the elevators and, and circulation spaces. And electric charging. And electric vehicle charging stations. Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> um, um, and I think that in the last slide we have to show you is the, um, you know, civil uh, or engineered uh, version of the site plan. And uh, I think the only thing I'll say about this would be the uh, to review the figures that Stephanie had kind of started off with. So from Dorothy Road, um, from the uh, the property line, these are the uh, the distances. So 103 feet to the closest um, part of the four story building. 145 feet toward the west end where it steps back. And this is where that section was taken that I was showing you. This again is the main entrance to the building. And then 171 feet, as Art had mentioned, is this eastern tab that, um, that comes off um, at, the, at the east end. Um, so uh, I think that's all I wanted to say. Uh, Art and Gwen, is there anything else uh, you wanted to add? We're in John's territory right now. This, this yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you know, thanks, Scott right, and, and Gwen. Um, and, and thank you to the, uh, to the board again for having us uh, back tonight. Um, I, I, would, I would say that I had the easy job this time around. Um, what I'm going to walk through is what what Gwen did with her sketch site plan and what Scott and Art and Kyle did with the architectural changes at the adding of the townhomes. It was really my job to put together this plan to just um, proof it so that we could be certain that it fit, it worked dimensionally, you know, the setbacks um, and some of the setbacks that Scott has just outlined that are highlighted in, in red on this plan. Um, so, and Gwen mentioned this. So the, um, Scott, if you could, with your cursor there, the emergency vehicle access road and, and pedestrian path that um, surrounds the building on, on three sides, the uh, east, south, and, and west sides. Um, we, we really locked that in. That's the exact same location it was shown on the 172 unit you know, single building, multifamily. Um, so we we really locked that in as as really a limit of work, um, and and tried to keep or not tried, you know, kept this revised development program within that same envelope, um, as you know, um, to not really encroach any closer to any of the wetlands or buffer or ARA. Um, so with, with that kind of as, as a backdrop, like that was a, a you know, very successful uh, accomplishment to fit this program in, um, kind of meeting that or, or using that as a constraint. And just to 
a few things that I did want to highlight, though. Um, I, I do want to highlight that this plan and the 172 unit plan that preceded this, uh, that dated back to November, has no work proposed in wetlands, either bordering vegetated wetlands or isolated vegetated wetlands. And I, and I just wanted to make that point clear. It's, it's been discussed that this project is filling wetlands or there's work in the wetlands. So I just, this project has no, um, or you know, the 172 unit or this revised version have proposes no work within BVW or IVW. Um, again, because we kept the limit of work um, to the original location of the emergency vehicle access drive, there's no additional um, permanent improvements proposed within the 100 foot buffer or the 100 foot aura under the uh, Arlington Wetlands Bylaw. Um, Scott, if you could move your cursor to where the R bows up into the, yeah, right there. So that we had that same uh, limited portion of the building um, proposed in the 172 unit proposal and the emergency access drive in that portion of the R. And then when the we reconfirmed or confirmed the existence of the isolated vegetated wetlands on the east side, the emergency vehicle access um, does, so right there, right there, yep. The portion of the access is in the outer limits of the R, but that's consistent with the, the previous proposal. Um, it, while we're discussing the R, there's, there's no work at all proposed um, in the 25 foot no disturb area zone to the R or to the BVW and IVW. And there's only a little limited amount of work um, proposed with actually within 50 feet of the BVW and that's associated with, uh, we discussed that at the last hearing associated with the compensatory flood storage design to be able to make that hydraulic connection. Um, we do have, uh, in full disclosure, we have some additional uh, floodplain impact with this revised proposal. And right there, Scott, if you could move your cursor directly north. Um, what we did or, or what, um, what Scott and our did was the main, the northerly east-west spine, just above Scott's cursor there, that spine of the building moved back about 26 feet or moved to the south about 26 feet, which resulted in 544 cubic feet of additional floodplain impact that Scott's kind of outlining there. So it's 544 cubic feet or in footprint, it's about 600 square feet, or, you know, um, two, as, as Stephanie said the other day, two good sized living rooms, um, you know, a, a 15 by 20, um, or 15, yeah, 15 by 20 uh, living room. So we, we do have that, but we have been able to expand our proposed compensatory storage areas to still provide a two to one uh, compensatory storage mitigation volume. Um, I, you know, another point I wanted to raise and um, have to go back, it, you know, the, the 172 unit multifamily building, it had the footprint of the building, but the footprint of the garage, if folks remember, it actually extended beyond the footprint of the you know residential portion of the building, the three courtyards, the the two in the front and the one in the rear uh, southwest corner, were all courtyards over the um, garage, so essentially impervious areas. Uh, with in this plan, the garage footprint is limited to the footprint of the senior level living building, so 
anything on this site plan that you see that's not either a driveway, you know, or parking spaces or shaded in gray, which is the, the senior live, living building and the, um, and the duplex buildings is, is, as Gwen likes to say, it's real dirt. It's uh, pervious areas. Um, so there's a significant reduction in the total impervious surface areas with this revised development program, um, which, you know, with the reduction in the density and the reduction in the impervious area, it, it really opens up a lot um, of flexibility and a lot of opportunity uh, to, to look more creatively or, or gives, provides more options for the stormwater management design. Stormwater management, again, with the reduction in impervious area, is, is not going to be as big of a challenge as it was on the 172 unit proposal. And we demonstrated and in, in with beta's peer review that we were able to accomplish that. Um, so with this plan, that becomes a, uh, it, there's, there's a lot more flexibility and opportunity to do some different things. And the last thing I wanted to mention on that is also by raising the, senior living building, you know, we're raising the ground around us, which provides us some more separation from groundwater, which again, gives us uh, more opportunities and flexibility to, to look at uh, ways to, um, to address, you know, that stormwater management. But kind of in summary on that, I, I think we demonstrated that on the larger 772 units, we were able to meet the stormwater requirements. And here, although this is a really conceptual level presentation, I'm confident, you know, I can confidently say that with this program, uh, you know, the civil engineering challenge of that just got uh, significantly easier to, uh, to accomplish. And I think that's, you know, really the high points. I think, again, the, you know, we wanted to make sure from an engineering perspective, everything, that we're showing here fit on the site plan. We're confident with the distances and the driveway widths and, and things like that. But the real change here is, is the, the program, the, the, the duplexes and, um, and, uh, and obviously the change from multifamily to uh, senior, senior housing with uh, independent and assisted living programs incorporated. Yeah, we, uh, we're going to introduce uh, Scott, I guess, but I wanted to just say one thing on that. Uh, were you finished, John? I assume? Yeah, yeah, I think um, I touched on the points I wanted to touch on. Uh, okay. Um, we, you know, we made a significant decision here to, to move to uh, senior housing. And um, I just wanted to emphasize that that was based on what we were hearing loud and clear and, and even experienced, obviously, um, the traffic on Lake Street is at peak hours is, is very, very challenging to say the least. And uh, although we demonstrated that the impact would be minimal, but there still is obviously an impact. Now, assisted living and independent living, you can see rationally that there are this reasoning I'm going to let Scott speak to that a little bit uh, because we don't have the numbers together on exactly what the savings in traffic or the diminishment of traffic would be. But it's clear that, um, that the assisted living uh, tenants, clientele, would not drive, would drive hardly at all. The independent living people who may, some will have cars and some will drive, uh, but with the traffic on Lake Street at peak hours, they're they have a choice. They're not working. They don't have to be at work at uh, eight thirty or nine o'clock. So they would choose to go later in the day. These are all hard things to uh, to, to verify with with numbers and charts, but it, it makes sense. And we're going to work on that to try to be a little bit more uh, definitive about that. And the staff, of course, they have the advantage of the red line. And uh, the project we did uh, in Dorchester was also in the red line, the red line extension. And uh, so we've had some experience with that. And the, and the staff tends to be uh, people that, uh, if there is public transportation, they use public transportation. So what we, what we are, our thought is that we're, we're making a major move in the direction of uh, less impact on, on traffic. 
because we understand that, um, uh, as I say, even though with 172 units, we felt like the the impact was not was 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 still minimal, but this is much more minimal for the reasons just stated. So, uh, Scott, are you going to? I assume you're going to add to that or talk about parking as well. Should we go back to the parking garage level, or I don't know? Did you want that, Scott? Uh, you know, it, this this plan is fine. I mean, we can go back if if need be, but uh, you know, this this graphic is fine. Um, so uh, thanks for that lead in art. Uh, for the record, Scott Thornton with Vanessa Associates. And uh, although John uh, thought that he had the easy part of, uh, of the project now that with the proposed change, I think the traffic part is even easier. Um, you know, I think that, that common sense would tell you that um, 126 unit senior housing complex will have a smaller traffic and parking impact than a 172 unit apartment building. Uh, in fact, this development has, as you heard previously, fewer units, fewer parking spaces, and a different type of, of resident profile. As Art indicated, we're still working through the numbers. We, we did go through some of the parking calculations and uh, we're, we're able to accommodate the parking requirements for the senior housing within the garage under the building with additional surface spaces for visitors. Based on ITE parking generation data, we need between 64 and 80 spaces for the two uses. And as was indicated previously, there's about 86 spaces in the garage, so we can, we can easily accommodate that demand. And that's also consistent for the assisted living component that's consistent with uh, the town bylaw, which, which requires 0.4 spaces per unit. Um, we've got another 10 surface spaces that can be used for visitors. Um, and so we feel that, that you know, we're able to accommodate the, the parking demands for the project. Um, in terms of the, of the traffic calculations, I think it's important to know, and we're still, we're still working through and finalizing those numbers. But I think in, in order to generate the, the traffic volumes that we were anticipating with the apartment complex, we were reliant on a pretty aggressive TDM program. And, um, and, and you know, we do, my office does a lot of, of, uh, of development of TDM programs for, for residential developments. We do a lot of the follow-up monitoring for these developments, obviously not now because of uh, conditions with the, with the pandemic, but but they work. They absolutely work. They they work to reduce the single occupant vehicle traffic. That is what generates a lot of the headaches when you know there's there's what there's a one car, one person, one car, one person, that sort of thing. Uh, and that's not you know that type of TDM program would not be required with this development. So, so right out of the gate, the base traffic traffic volumes, of vehicle trip generation would be lower with this with this type of development. And as I was mentioning, you know, most of the travel associated with senior housing or seniors in housing is discretionary in terms of the time of travel. They can choose to travel outside of the commuter hours when traffic congestion is less of an issue. And in fact, some IT data indicates that the, that the assisted living components have their peak periods in the middle of the day. And that's really visitors and staff because the assisted living, the, the residents aren't generating the traffic. So that's opposed to a conventional development with the typical peaks in the morning and the evening commuter hours. So, you know, again, there's not much to say with regards to traffic and parking. Right? We, we would expect the new development with a downsized unit count with fewer parking spaces and a different resident demographic to present less of a traffic and parking impact than the previous proposal. Um, so I think uh, that that's really all I have to say on, on traffic at this point. Um, I'll turn it back over to Stephanie and uh, be available for questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Scott. 
Um, I, I think at this point, um, I want to thank the board somewhat on two fronts. One, for um, kind of putting this challenge to us at the last hearing to ask us to look back at reintroducing the duplex because I think it um, had us look at a number of things. And, um, and I want to thank the board for its consideration of this, um, our presentation of the, uh, this alternative concept this evening. Um, in closing, I just want to maybe like hit maybe five or six of what we think are kind of the, um, the key points that kind of directly hit issues that have previously been raised during the course of the public hearings. And, and first we'll start off with the most obvious because it's the request to look at bringing back duplexes. And uh, we think that we can successfully do that and, and it provides a consistency with the neighborhood and the scale. And, and it, it also um, provides the buffering for the um, senior assisted living. But like I said, it, it, it does provide um, what we heard from a number of people that they wanted kind of the, the streetscape that they were used to on the other side of Dorothy Road. Um, and then secondly, um, the amount of impervious area um, on this on this revised plan is, is significantly reduced, I think as John termed it. Um, and we have that whole Western side that's available for open space now um, that, that creates a very nice opportunity there. Um, Thirdly, uh, the buildings have the, the multifamily built, or pardon me, the, uh, the four-story senior assisted living building. It's completely out of the water table. We have the garage at elevation six and the first floor at elevation 16. Um, and then the duplexes on the front of the street here, they're at elevation 12. And you know the road itself is, is somewhere around um, nine and a half or 10. Um, Fourth, uh, we think that the, as Scott just presented, that the decrease in density um, from 138 total, um, 126 of those being senior and assisted living, um, that change um, in addition to the reduction of parking, but it gives us a, a reduction in base traffic generation. And then uh, fifth, um, this, the size of the apartment building itself um, has been notably reduced. Reduced. So I, I think those are some of the key features. A lot more of the sub features um, were presented, you know, through Scott and John and Art and, and the other Scott um, this evening. But with that said, um, uh, we are happy to answer any questions that the board may have. And um, our hope is that uh, we'd like to request the board to support this revised concept plan um, at the end of this evening's hearing. Um, and, and even to uh, take a straw poll to see where the board is on this. Um, if there's support for this, we're gonna continue down this path. If there isn't support for this, th then I guess we would go back to our 172, but um, we hope you, we have your support. And again, we're happy to field any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, I really appreciate it. And, and thank you for the very thorough um, explanation of all all aspects of this project where it is such a such a departure from what we were looking at before it's really i think very helpful to walk through everything um would like to uh first ask members of the board if they have specific questions they would like to ask at this time mr chairman mr hanlon um <clears throat> i wonder if we can go back to the question of i'm a little bit unclear about how it is that changing this mode or the over to the senior uh, or to the combination of the duplexes and the and the senior uh, uh, and assisted living, um, how that works along with the uh, the reservation of affordable units, and I take it that with respect to the uh, duplexes. Uh, we're talking here about three of those units being affordable and with a deed restriction, which is essentially perpetual. Is that correct? No, that's Just, correct. Yes. As I understand. Um, and what is the level of income affordability for ownership? Is that the, it's really, there's there's it, it usually is expressed in some some multiple some percentage of AMI, but is that eighty percent the way it is for rental or is it different? It's eighty percent. 
Yeah, it, it's the same for a rental development or a home ownership development. Okay. Um, so now with respect to the seniors, that's split into two categories. One is the independent living and one is the, um, the assisted living. Uh, are the units, are that, first of all, I guess the question is, are we still looking at within that category, 25% of the units being affordable at the 80% level? That is correct. Uh, and is that equally, is that split proportionately between the assisted living units and the independent living units? How is that, how does that work out? Um, I may ask, I, I believe that it is, but Bob Angler, if you're on the um, line, if you want to feel that. Sure. It's the same thing. Uh, can people hear me? We can, yes. Bob. It's the same thing as one, two, and three bedrooms. You you have 25% in each category. In this case, the category is assisted and independent. So your 25% is in both areas. Okay. Um, and that, uh, just to make sure it's clear on the record, uh, the restrictions there are essentially perpetual. Is that correct? On, on a rental, um, you, what on, you the have rent, is, on the rental ones. Right, you have it built into. So when you have home ownership, it goes with the deeds, the, right. the restriction. Um, there's a regulatory agreement that, that provides for the continued affordability and, in, in the regulatory agreement. Right, and that rental agreement provides for affordability over what period of time? Uh, I, I believe it's it would. In, it's in perpetuity, basically, because the regulations state that the you'd have to prove that there was no further need for affordable housing to get released from that regulate from that uh, stipulation. So in effect, it's staying on, on forever. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. So on a question I had on the, with respect to the townhouses, uh, when you say that the top floor is a half story, um, is that a half, ha have you, looked at our bylaw to see how a half story is calculated and is that is is that a generic statement or a statement that it would comply with the half story requ requirement in our bylaw um stephanie do you have any wisdom on that um no i don't i i i would uh, need to double check what the bylaw said the, the version that's applicable to this project and um if it if if it didn't comply, we would we would request the waiver of it. Um, we, we haven't updated any waiver lists. So um, so I'm, I'm not entirely certain, Mr. Hanlon, I guess I, I would need to double check with Art in terms of that. On the, on the height and feet, did I read the chart correctly that the ridge line is 40 feet? For the townhouses, for the duplexes. Uh, I think that's right. Yes, there you go. The, the, the highest peak is 40 feet, right? I think the other, the B is maybe a little bit less high. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, just to add, uh, try to add something to the two and a half stories, the half story, we're thinking of it really in plan. In other words, the plan is half the size of the second story. It's not half the height, obviously. You couldn't no, I understand that. that. Uh, but also, it, uh, it's the... Um, there are many, many buildings in the neighborhood, which is why we felt uh, it was okay doing that, doing this particular design that are the same two and a half story format, where there's a, a single room or a, maybe uh, in, in our case, we actually have the master bedroom on the top floor. Right. Well, that, that's, it's incorporated in the bylaw how we do, do that. So there's, it's not, there's yeah. nothing that says you can't have a half story. Um, but the bylaw, if I'm not mistaken, also has a maximum height of 35 feet. And uh, I'm wondering, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry, sorry, Mr. Hanlon. Um, so that would depend on the zoning district, I believe. And this is PUD, right? In the PUD district, which has a higher threshold. So is the 40, consistent or not consistent with the underlying zoning now? So it, 
those are all under the PUD districts. And I don't recall the, the maximum height off the top of my head, but I'm busily scrambling to look it up in the background. It, it's 80 feet, but for when it's residential, it's five stories is the tallest. Okay. So everything is well below that five story limit. But the rest of the neighborhood is not um, PUD, right? So they're, they're probably at 35 feet while this is 40 feet. So while if you looked at the chart, if, if you looked at the uh, site plan, these look to be narrower than the townhouses, the, uh, that is to say the duplexes across the street. Uh, it also looks to me like they're, they're somewhat taller you can see on the left there, the, the approximate height of the existing duplexes on Dorothy Road being somewhat, being around the size of the, of the gable that is, is next to the, is on the second floor. So this is a little taller, basically, a little narrower and a little taller than the existing houses along Dorothy Road. Is that fair? Yes. <laughs> Right, that I, you know, with later when we do straw polling or whatever we do, this is, it seems to me, a major positive development. We, I had mentioned last time, I thought that up to now, uh, there had been a, a, a lot of, a lot of work done on making this better for the wetlands and to addressing that issue, which was exactly the right priority to do, uh, but to get really kind of to where you wanted to go, you needed to make a, a some kind of a move in this direction. And while you're still working on detailed plans and uh, Marta's people are no doubt looking towards reviewing your plans and we need to think more, think about what a schedule would look like in the future. But it seems to me this is a giant step forward and uh, I'm, I'm pleased with it. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Other other questions, Mr. Revelak? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a few questions. Um, the first was, I just wanted to, conf I, I believe Ms. Kiefer mentioned it, but I missed it. Uh, roughly, what is the elevate surface elevation of Dorothy Road? Like nine feet? I believe it's nine and a half feet. Um, maybe John can correct me if I'm wrong. Yep, there we go, nine and a half feet. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I assume, um, just our district regulations for for PUD um, don't uh, do not include assisted living as a use, but I just um, so I, I presume that will be coming in a waiver at some point. Yes. Okay. Um, could we? Could, would it be possible to bring up slide eleven, or perhaps slide eight? I think either one would would do. Yeah, I was. Curious to know where will the rear property line of the duplexes be, roughly? Ten feet back from the rear of the building. Okay, so a ten foot rear yard. Okay, very good. And what kind of? Um, so I see. So that leaves a little bit of a buffer between the rear, the duplex rear yard, and the senior building. And I was wondering what. I know this is still kind of early, but I was wondering what kind of uh, screening you might be contemplating. So if we go back to the site plan, um, what, we, what, what we have thought about and all this, we, we haven't got a, um, the landscaper you know, totally engaged, but there could be uh, a six foot fence at the back of the, the little small yard, but what we're, proposing here is that really it's a landscape buffer um, mm -hmm. and and there would you know and you can do quite a lot with the space that's that is there uh, in terms of of just having a nice planting area and then the walk and right now we you know you, you see there's a little note about bikes and maintenance on that side mm -hmm. but I think we be with the reduction of parking, uh, we can have even more area back there because there's there's an extra storage space in the basement, the in the garage. So um, I think it will be uh, really a a buffer area that, mm -hmm. that will be landscaped. Okay, no, that's that, that's good. Um, so uh, speaking of, since I saw a bike on the draw on the sketch, I assume the blue bike station uh, is no longer necessary. 
not for or no longer contemplated. <laughs> I think this po population would would not be uh, serious bicycle riders. Although mm -hmm. I think we, you know, I, I would encourage it still. It occurred to me. I didn't say it earlier, but I I, I would love to see you know tricycles, the adult tricycles that mm -hmm. that that would allow. Uh, people to go, you know, to do a little shopping or something and, and still have a degree of right stability uh, along the bike path. Okay. Um, now, okay, so with, I, I, I'm aware that it for a normal apartment buildings, um, you know, comprehensive permit projects usually have a 10% requirement for three bedrooms. And I assume for this use, that's not applicable. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, still, I presume that we're still planning to use aggregate piles. Yes, to the extent, I mean, if we need piles, uh, I think, that, yeah, if, aggregate yeah. piles, yeah. I, uh, I know that that's uh, that's something that came up a number of times, so I just wanted to you know, uh, ask and make sure. And um, I know this is still very early in the process, but uh, one of I was going to ask a couple of questions about how the new building would um, affect the drainage plan, and I think Mr. Hessian, you know, partially answered them in you know in this at least in the sense that. Uh, the reduction in impervious surface makes the job easier. I'm wondering if um, any of the colleague, our colleagues from Beta could comment on that. Um, and I realize realize it, if it's too early for you to feel comfortable commenting, that's fine. Please. Uh, if I might, Mr. Chairman, Bill McGrath with Beta. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think in general, a reduction in impervious area is going to be a benefit to, to trying to manage stormwater on the site. Um, we certainly still have to see the, the layout and how the footprint of that storm, stormwater management system fits. But uh, I would say I, I agree in general, it's a, it's a positive in terms of trying to manage stormwater. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Evelack. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please, Mr. Ford. Um, I, I have, uh, I've, got, I've got one question question um uh, first of all the changes are extremely positive so i, I commend you you all on uh what you've done i am very pleased and surprised actually but uh, pleased um one of the major concerns i still have though is the construction in the in the buffer zone of the wetlands particularly the bottom left corner of the building it, it, is it not possible to slide that building up a little bit or that wall or that that wing up so we're not constructing in that buffer on the left um let's see scott can you put your cursor he's, he's, on he's trying to move it yeah right there move that up. it's um it's a challenge because of the layout of the parking below the uh that offset is about 42 feet which is a uh, parking dimension. It's one space plus one aisle, and that's what established that. Uh, we could look into that, but it, it would, uh, we might have to sacrifice parking spaces, but um, I think one other thing uh, about that is the, the, we felt that the space, which is now, what is that, 145 feet, and uh, that's 100 feet. I think it's, um, I think it's 85 feet from the back of the townhouse to the other wall of the, uh, the four-story high building. And that's a pretty nice space. It's big enough to have a lot of trees and LA. Um, and I think the townhouse to the street is 20 feet, which is, again, a pretty sacred dimension. We don't want to push the townhouses, the duplexes any nearer to the street. So there's a, there, there's a lot of decisions <laughs> that go into that, but we have to take a look at it. I, I guess I, I would say that, that that space to have to have room uh, for parking for a driveway coming in uh, to do the turnaround. You can see there's not much space on either side of the turnaround, and that's that's kind of like what the the civil engineers uh, recommend. Um, you know, I I I think that 
Um, and I'd like John to speak about the John's John. yeah about the the um, the relative uh, issues around around moving moving the uh, moving out of the aura. So, but from a from a site plan standpoint, this is basically what we had before, and and we 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 would really like to stick with that part of it. But please, John John Hessian, can you speak to this? Sure, uh, John Hessian. Again, thank you. Um, I'll I'll leave the you know the question of could, could the architecture be modified up to you know that question up to uh, to Art and, and Scott. But um, I think one thing I wanted to point out is, as Gwen just mentioned, you know, this is the same impact that that we've been working with um, into that R a couple hundred square feet, um, basically since November when we submitted the 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 revised plans in in November and the updated confirmed wetland delineation, um, and I, I think it's important to note too that. Construction in the outer limit of the ARA that's shown there is not prohibited um, under the wetland bylaw. And Scott, if you could go to Gwen's color sketch. Um, and, you know, what Gwen has labeled down <laughs> on the bottom of the drawing there, wet, woodland restoration, um, you know, the, the thought and the idea is the commitment to remove invasive species and, and remove the impacts of the, the homeless population that's been you know, out on this property for years. Um, there would be an opportunity to actually improve the R in that, you know, with a restoration in the area where we have that very limited building impact. So um, I think if we aren't able to move it, I, I do believe we've kind of really taken that into close consideration and looked at ways that um, we could improve the, 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 the values of that aura, um, you know, with that restoration, with that invasive species uh, management and, and woodland restoration. Thank you. Uh, and that's fair. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, you're presenting a concept that's, um, in my view, um, significantly better than what we had. Uh, but given, uh, and, but I would like if you guys could at least take a look to see what we could do, because I have concerns about um, losing any wetlands or even, even the, um, the buffer zone of the wetlands. But, uh, but but that but thank you, um, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Mr. Mills. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I would like to thank the applicant for an excellent revision of the plan and a lot of hard work in a short amount of time. I think it was a very good idea not including garages underground for the uh, six duplexes. <laughs> Obviously, it would be a problem. I think raising the grade around the duplexes and around the main building was uh, very key. I think that's a good idea. The garage is now uh, above the water table, which should be cause, should intuitively cause less disruption to the water flow uh, of the site and of the whole area towards the Elwife Brook. So I applaud all those changes. And um, I just wanted to say I do look forward to the further development of this project. I know there will be those that uh, want nothing there, but if something's going to be there, this is a very significant pro, uh, improvement. And it also does address senior housing issues, which is a key demographic to take care of. Uh, I think that was a very good idea of yours. Uh, I do just have one question about the driveways with the six duplexes. The last duplex looks like it's got the driveway coming in off the driveway of the comp to the apartments. Yeah. Is that true? Yes, uh, that's that's correct. In order to, um, uh, to use the space, have less pavement and so on. Yeah. 
we're, we brought it in off the off the, the uh, entry drive. Yeah. And that's true on the other end also. But, uh, it, and John's drawing is better than mine because uh, he 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 made the uh, the uh, east end of the of the development show how the driveway on the on the east end is is a proper driveway. Mm -hmm. I know you're really at the conceptual stage right now, so many questions would go unanswered at this time. But uh, people will be expecting answers to the questions of how many staff, how they're going to get there how they're going to park, where are they going to be on the site, et cetera, what delivery schedules would be, uh, impact on traffic, et cetera. But intuitively, this sounds like it will be an improvement over the original. And again, we thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. Hello. I have a couple of questions, and some of it is I just want to see if I'm comparing apples to apples uh, based upon the notes I had taken at the March 11th meeting. And I'm just trying to get a sense as to what the dimensional changes really, um, what they really are. So I believe at the 172 unit stage, if my notes are correct, Mr. Hessian had indicated that the total square footage of all four floors was 195,000 square feet and the footprint was around 54 five almost. And today for the back building, I think I'm looking at 32708 per floor. And that's about 13832. So there's a difference between those two of almost 64,000 square feet. But I'm curious as to what the footprint, combined footprint is for the, um, for the duplex uh, units in the front. I, I'm just wondering what the sort of the site coverage is in terms of footprint. Um, it's 12 times 1,600, whatever that is. And it's 10,400 square feet. Six times 1,600. No, no, it's no. 1,600 square feet. Yeah, 1,640 by 40 is 1,600. And then- So you have two and a half and floors, six two and a half times that. Oh, well, he's just saying the footprint, not, not the- right. Yeah, that was right, the footprint. So that's what, 19.2 on top of the almost 131? Yeah, they're 40 by 40, the footprint of the buildings. Yeah, 9,600. 9, uh, 9,600. Oh, so, the, so that 9,600, you're, you're talking about the 40 by 40 is one entire duplex. It's not just one half. That's right. Okay. And, and and the carport that's not including the the carport okay. we haven't decided how to do that but that that would add and there was a comment made again I think by mr. Hessian about the raising of the building and from the earlier meeting I saw that the height above the street was 47 feet and I believe in looking at the plans here today we're looking at 60 feet is that correct Uh, Scott, does that show in your section? Scott, are you there? Have we lost him? I apologize. I uh, I was uh, taking a quick break. Um, the, you're looking for the section? Yeah. Go to the section and then uh, if you could rephrase that uh, question. Right. The question is, the, I think the other section has the heights, Scott. Take the other one. Okay, this one here. Uh, the other one. Oh, that. Are you looking, you're looking for the heights of the duplex unit. The height of the four story. Yeah. Oh, the height of the four story. Yeah, so scroll over to the right. Yeah. 60. Well, let me clarify. That's, that's okay. elevation. That's that's an elevation. So the, the, the street is at elevation 9.5. So you subtract 9.5 from that to get, get the height above the street. That's what my that's what my so question is. 50.5 feet above the elevation of the street. Okay. Mr. So Duke. it's roughly the same as the earlier plan, maybe three feet more. And then I don't know is this is part of what's before the board, but I do have a question. I think it's for Mr. Klipfel. So 
do I understand that the building itself is divided into, um, excuse me, from, I wanna look at my note. Uh, so is the building divided into sections for independent and assisted, is that correct? Uh, that's correct. And we, uh, we went through this pretty carefully with, uh, again, with the senior living uh, residences, Bob Larkin, and it would be, uh, you come into the lobby and the independent living would be to your left as you turn south. Uh, and the assisted right. living would be to your right, so your yeah. left as you turn your eyes south, looking toward the deck. Yeah. Now, okay. this may go through machinations. You know, there's an issue of uh, the twin elevators, and Bob thought that could work. Uh, now, we probably, we might want to consider separating, you know, having two banks of elevators. I don't know. So there are things like this that when we fine tune this, he has a whole staff in his organization right now that uh, specializes in this. And if we're moving ahead, we'll sort of get them and, and work through these issues. Okay, well, thanks. But I, I was just curious, what happens if somebody needs to move from independent living to a more assisted living situation? Is that somehow uh, able to be dealt with? Well, that's, that's actually something that uh, happens as we understand it fairly often. And uh, you just change rooms. I mean, you would go to the other side. You'd go into the independent, the assisted living uh, side. Uh, and, that, and I understand that. I was just thinking, though, that if you have one of the, uh, I'm assuming, you know, you have the same percentages of affordable units, um, you know, that you would have for assisted and then for the independent. And if somebody had an affordable, say, independent living unit and they needed to have assisted uh, care and they'd have to wait for a, a unit on the other side to be available in order for it to qualify as an yeah. affordable assisted this living? This is a sort of a management question, which um, uh, we haven't had a lot of experience with the actual management side of things, but maybe Bob, do you have a, uh, Bob yeah. Angler? Yeah. Uh, the way it works is the affordable unit, uh, the resident can move into an ass assisted unit, whether it's a market or, or affordable, whatever the first turnover is. And if that affordable unit be, uh, in, takes over from a market unit, then the next unit that opens on the assisted side has to be market. So they don't try and limit it specific. I mean, they keep the overall ratio the same, but they don't stop somebody from moving. It would be the same thing if somebody gave up a market unit uh, on the independent side and the supportable came in, the next unit then has to be market. So they manage it so that it, it works out within the year, probably. Understood. Okay, thank you. That was all I had. And what I guess underlining the, 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 uh, the, the general uh, observation that all the units are the same, they're, they're none that are, are permanently uh, affordable and so they're 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 all finished the same and equally good and and i said i was done but i do have one other just observation i'll be very interested to see what the difference is in the traffic calculations because i believe your assumptions are obviously different and i know intuitively people are saying it should be less traffic impact people have more choice and flexibility in terms of when they would leave times a day that they would go out and, and that does make sense. But I also wonder if when you had earlier projections about who might be living there before this particular iteration came along, um, I, I think there was you know some percentage of the people who were gonna be living there who were gonna be using mass transit. So I'm just curious to see how that's actually gonna come out. And I'd be interested to have some detail on that. Thank you. One thing we didn't mention, which is just uh, worth putting on the table that uh, came up, is there, uh, there uh, are deliveries, more deliveries than you would have had with the multifamily. But uh, again, what Bob said about that is uh, given uh, the situation on Lake Street, that uh, people delivering things would, again, do that during the middle of the day, uh, not during peak uh, traffic time. So. Uh, he thought that wouldn't uh, wouldn't be a, a big negative impact, but uh, you know, as Scott said, you know, I think we'll we'll do some work on that and all all these things. But it is true that 
uh, one of the factors there's independent living, assisted living, of course, not so much traffic at all. Uh, and then there's more deliveries probably uh, given the nature of the, you, know, you have a kitchen uh, and uh, also even medical services that, uh, that would probably increase the traffic a little bit. I'm glad, excuse me, I'm glad you said that because I know it's sunrise on Mass Ave in Arlington. It's not unusual to see, you know, the uh, ambulance, the fire truck and the police car all sort of converging on the place. And it happens fairly frequently. So you're also taking that sort of into consideration in your comment, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess one, one thing that um, in the other uh, assisted living that we did uh, in Lower Mills, um, one of the reasons we, we located it there was because um, it was near a, a red line tea stop. And many of the staff people do use the tea. And uh, we hope that we hope that in the in the evolution of the of the conservation land that there would be a a nice path across the through the woods to the tea stop. But that's wishful thinking right now. Thank you. Are there any further questions on the board? <clears throat> I hadn't thought of that before, but it really it would be over the fields and through the woods to grandmother's house we go. <laughs> right. Um, so we have a number of, of speakers who are who have raised their hands, but just to um, <clears throat> provide a little background. So I will be opening the public comment period on the revised design for the proposed project. Um, just a few reminders, public questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Um, to reward, <clears throat> excuse me, to provide for an orderly flow to the meeting and to allow the inclusion of many voices, the chair would like to limit individual public speakers to three minutes, but encourage you to use your time to provide comment related to the indicated topic. An additional time may be provided at the discretion of the chair to provide time for questions to be addressed. Uh, the chair encourages the public to provide written comments to be reviewed by the board and included in the record. This is especially true if you have specific recommendations in regards to the project. Uh, the first procedure for requesting to speak will be the same as for previous hearings. Please select the raise hand button from the comments tab on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone to indicate you would like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself by name and address. You'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps us generate accurate minutes. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the time allocated by the chair has ended, the public comment period will be closed. Uh, the board and staff will do our best to show documents being discussed. If you'd like a specific document to be pulled up during your comment, please ask us to do so. Um, so with a name, um, Ms. Chapman. Thank you, Chairman Klein. Uh, Susan Chapnick, the chair of the Conservation Commission in the town of Arlington. Um, I appreciate the thoroughness of the explanation of the changes. Um, I also appreciate that the changes have tried not to um, impact the wetland resource areas or the floodplain. Um, I understand that the floodplain is uh, impacted greater than the plans, the latest set of plans that we looked at January 21st, 2021. However, the applicant has said that the compensatory storage at the level of two to one can still be realized in the area proposed previously. Um, that's something I would like to review, um, but that's good news. Uh, in terms of the encroachment of the new building footprint into the outside of the aura. And I will remind um, the uh, everyone online that in the town of Arlington, the buffer zone is a resource area. So it is considered a wetland resource area. So that is an impact. It is correct that our uh, local bylaw and implementing regulations do um, sometimes allow for um, work within this upland resource area, this buffer area. 
with mitigation. And I will say that the previous plan did not have any encroachment of the building on the south side into our resource area. So I think that was a misstatement from John um, before the, um, the roadway did impinge, but the building did not, at least on the 121, 2021 plans. So I am a little disappointed that the building is moved down. I understand that a lot of this is give and take and we have to weigh a lot of issues in this 40B. Um, so I just wanted to make that statement that I hope that um, the applicant can look at that as Mr. Ford had also requested. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Um, Kiefer, yes. Um, could I quickly have John Hessian um, just respond to that? Because I, I think there's some confusion. Um, and and I, I think that I had heard John presented in his um, presentation, but John, if you're available, could you quickly explain how the, uh, the subsurface parking um, on that lower portion there of the building under the uh, 172 multifamily had worked? Uh, absolutely, and, and, and through the chair to Ms. Chapnick, um, on the previous plan, the building, and when I say the building, that includes the basement garage level, um, did encroach into that aura the exact same limit that we're showing here. It, the, the garage level um, protruded out of the ground, but the, uh, um, oh, thank you, Scott. <laughs> um, so the white area that you see is the garage level and on the rear where Scott's cursor is, that's where the rear Southwest courtyard was. Um, so elevated above the, the ground around it. Um, so the, it, it, the building did encroach into that aura, but not the residential living spaces above that are the darker gray shaded areas. So what, what Scott and Art did was they, they held that southerly garage line and just slid the living spaces over that space. So um, that, that may not have been ab abundantly clear um, on the previous plan, but th that is the exact same limit of the, the building southerly wall. So the previous plan I was looking at sheet C105 did not correctly depict where that limit of work was in relation to the aura. I don't know if I have a copy of that. Because that was the plan that um, the Conservation Commission reviewed in relation to wetland resource areas. And I believe it's the same plan that Beta uh, Group also reviewed. Well, John's looking for that plan. I, I, I can assure you that it, it, it has been consistently shown this way. It, not, it may not have been entirely obvious, but it, 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 there, there has been um, uh, an indication. And in, in, in fact, in the last drawing that, that um, we did for the, the previous plan, we showed a walk going from the deck across in front of the units on the roof of the garage um, and then and then stepping down to the to the uh, uh, ch children's play area it's going to take me a minute to fight and um, Susan miss Jack Chapnick what was the date of the plan that you just referenced the um, C105. It was, uh, it's C105 and the date of the file is 0121 2021. 0121. That's the file date. Well, it was 2021 01 01 underscore revised underscore plan underscore sheets. Okay, it'll take me a minute to find the exact drawing. Sure. Uh, 
I, I, I believe that um, it misrepresented the limit of work because it didn't include the underground parking. I guess that's what you're saying now, which was not clear to the Conservation Commission and may or may not have been clear to VEDA at that time because we would have said something. Yeah, and, and while I'm looking for it, and, and there was nothing intentionally, you know, to, to you know, avoid that. That, as, as Gwen just mentioned, the, the emergency vehicle access um, road, that's why that was located where it was. It's, it was outside of the, the building garage footprint and the, the rear courtyard and the walkway down off of that over to the play area on the west side was on top of that, um, that portion of the garage that projected south of the, the residential floors above. But, um, so John, if this is gonna take you a few minutes to look up, uh, Ms. Chapman, if you wouldn't mind, um, so I'll let you look it up, I'll, I'll move on and I'll come back to you. Mr. Chair, if I just can add, um, I just pulled up that plan that Susan was referencing and it definitely does not, um, it shows the footprint of the um, building um, outside the aura and it, it's really not clear that the, um, that the parking was underneath it. So, um, so we'll take a look at the next set of plans. Okay. Um, so I will move on to uh, Mr. McKinnon. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering why the decision was. Uh, I'm sorry. You, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. My name is Matt McKinnon. I live at 9 Little John Street in Arlington. Please proceed. Thank you. I was wondering why the decision was made to not include underground parking garages and also not include basements for the townhomes. Um, if I could pass it on to um, either Gwen or Art. Well, I I think uh, what we were doing uh, garages for the townhouses, they were on a ramp. And I think it was pointed out that uh, if the street had flooding, that the flood would come down the ramp and then into the basement. Uh, yeah, that's a very easy problem to take care of uh, flooding. You know, you just put some drains in. Um, I'm just, you know, a lot of this seems like there's, uh, there's like smoke and mirrors even. We just, you know, saw the confusion about the living space in the building on the previous plan being above ground, but there was a great encroach uh, below ground where the parking garage was. Uh, this seems kind of like the same thing where, you know, you're, you're taking away uh, space because of an obvious issue of flooding uh, and wetlands, uh, but there's still a parking garage, uh, you know, closer to the wetlands now uh, or where it's always been. Uh, why aren't we taking this and moving it above ground like you're doing it to the townhomes? So just to just to understand your question, you're asking why the why we don't, why the apartment building isn't raised in elevation so that its parking doesn't need to be below grade. Correct. Um, well, I think uh, there be there are many buildings of this type. In fact, we've done some that do that. They have no garage. We did a building in Chelsea that was the best example. The okay, so what about the basements? Why are there no basements? The basement slab. And the, the, the townhomes, I do, I, excuse me, the duplex houses, I believe, do have basements. They just don't have. Uh, they were optional access. basements. The, the, uh, well, there was a ramp that went down to the basement. And that's where we got uh, concerned about flooding. Somebody pointed. Can you clarify whether the basements are optional or not? Uh, we, we are assuming right now that's showing a full basement in that section, a full basement, which again would be uh, uh, access from a stair that would start out at elevation 11 uh, and go down. And that would be not subject to flooding from the street at elevation nine and a half. Now, we, we believe that it makes sense to have probably not a full basement, uh, but a half basement. That's actually showing a full basement. As you can see, this is a, a work in progress. Yeah, I see that. But I also heard that it, they were optional basements, meaning you would not put them in unless the owner decided they wanted the basement. No, we're, we, 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 we uh, haven't. This is an early enough design 
that we just I just want a clarification on that. We, I just wanted it, uh, it, uh, the the word optional was a was a mis misspeaking. Um, we we haven't made a decision as to how large the basement should be. Um, you know, but we think it's useful to have a basement. That there's value in having a basement, but it doesn't necessarily need to be the full the full size. We're just thinking about bikes. And, and you know sports equipment and things that people like to put away and and that uh, it would be useful to have some kind of a basement but we didn't want to have it be subject to flooding so that was something we were exactly so so if that's subject to flooding then why are you putting cars in an underground parking garage because in the in, in the area where we have got the garage it's very close to the grade level. The grade beyond the garage is, is about seven. And- um, But it's also closer to actually on top of the 100 foot aura. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. I'd appreciate it if Mr. McKinnon would let uh, the answer proceed. He's been interrupting the Gwen uh, several times and I apologize. This is sort of a turning into a cross examination directly with a, a witness, and that really is contrary to our rules and how we're supposed to do this thing. Thank you, Mr. I'm sorry. Just wanted a clear, I'm just trying to get clear answers rather than runarounds. No. Well, the, if you give them an opportunity here. Um, the, the design of a building like this, you have many, many different things weighing into the position of a building. As I mentioned, a project in Chelsea where there was uh, no problem with height whatsoever. We were uh, away from any abutting neighborhoods. Uh, we raised the building up to grade, even a little bit above grade, had parking under the building and a, what's called a podium, and then had the building above that. Now here, where there's abutting neighbors and a concern about building height and that sort of thing, we have the uh, garage, as you can see right now, we raised it three feet. Oops raises it above the uh, groundwater level at 2.85. So we're now at elevation six. So we're that far above the uh, groundwater plane, but everything is, is an adjustment uh, to the different forces on the building. You're, in this case, we were trying to keep the building as low as possible, uh, as dry as possible. And as you mentioned at the beginning of your statement, there, there are ways to control this with, with drains and drainage and pumps and all that kind of stuff. I don't think we need that here. But uh, it, 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 it's something that if you, if you can do what we're doing in the townhouses and have no ramps going down to the garage, that's preferable. But sometimes as a compromise, that's what you have to do. That's the decision we made. So that's what it is. And Thank you. just one more note on that. The, the means of controlling grades and drainage and so on for a garage that has one main entry uh, and 86 parking spaces is is um, is much more manageable than you know managing drainage car by car. Mm -hmm. So that's there's an efficiency in the garage. No, thank you, Mr. McKinnon. No, I'm done. I've gone over. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McKinnon. Um, uh, Ms. Keith Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Heather Keith Lucas of 10 Mott Street in Arlington. I appreciate the concessions that the applicant has made and the return of the townhomes are more appropriate in the neighborhood. Um, though I do recognize there's an open question regarding the bylaws regard, um, in the third floor face of the, of the proposed new townhomes is different than the current home fronts of, of Dorothy Road homes. Um, I remain concerned about the flooding um, and recognize that this proposal is still in its infancy for the applicant. So I do hope that the ZBA can have more information about the comprehensive system of water drainage that will be included in their plans. Specifically with the duplex style homes, it, and, uh, it, to me it seems that the first floors of the new proposed 
duplex style townhomes appear lower than the height of the current townhomes on Dorothy Road. So I'm just concerned about water going through the front doors of these new homes. Um, and also more fully understanding about how the water is going to flow from Dorothy Road into the property. So if we do have duplex townhomes that are going across the full front, if you will, of Dorothy Road with carports in between, is does that cause a barrier across all of Dorothy Road? So where does where does the water flow or is it just bumping up against the homes and and the car um, the carport areas? Um, also concerns about the underground parking for the independent and assisted living facilities as well. And then a couple of questions for Please. the applicant and another question to the, the, Z, um, uh, the, the ZBA. Um, the two questions to the applicant is, is there a time limit for the property use or is the applicant's proposal a commitment to permanent property use of independent and assisted living. And the second question is, what is the applicant's proposal for the independent assisted living residents to receive meals? Um, I recognize that the plan is still in development, but there doesn't appear to be a dining hall or uh, a kitchen area for pre preparation of meals for the residents. And um, then if, to if the it, ZBA. Go ahead and um, ask, oh, okay. ask for answers to those two questions. Because hopefully we can get those fairly quickly. Um, Ms. Kiefer, what would be the, in regards to the, the time limit for the use of the building? I'm assuming that if the use is included in the, um, in the decision for 40B, then it is, for the length of the that the agreement is in place, it would need to remain. That is correct. And and if, if let's say down the road someone went to change it, they obviously would have to come before the board and ask for that change because that would be built into the comprehensive permit. So it's not like it can just change. Um, and, and so the, the use, um, I think as, as Bob Angler had, had previously said though, that basically you're, you're, you're pretty much locked into um, the use for the affordability. And if for some reason someone went to like, convert, I mean, the style of it would be obviously not meant for a multifamily. Um, as we talked about, there's more community rooms and, and there's small rooms. They'd have to like redo the entire interior and it would need to come before the board for a, a change of use. You know, and then the board would have an ability to weigh in on that. Um, so I, I think that answers that one. And then um, with respect to the, the second question, if I understood it correctly, um, when, uh, when Art was going through just the schematic of the first floor, he was showing the area that would be like the uh, the commercial kitchen and then the, the dining room for the for the assisted living persons um, and, it, and it is a different program and you know if if the board wants us to continue down with this um, design concept um, you know we can provide kind of more information in terms of how the interior layout goes in terms of um, you know as suggested we need a lot more community space when you have senior living assisted and independent than you would in an apartment building. So um, at, at, this, at this point though, I, we do recognize that the, uh, the schematic of the first floor interior is, um, it, is very modest. Um, it, was, it was more to show the board kind of the entryway and, and how once you came in as, as Art had suggested, you turn the one way and you're in the assisted and the other way you're in the independent. Thank you, Ms. Kiefer. Um, Ms. Keith Lucas? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my additional questions are maybe just for consideration for the ZBA, um, just given the nature of assisted living facilities and independent, um, ensuring that we have enough access for emergency vehicles and also good sight lines in terms of the curves um, in, in the road as well. Um, and then also echoing other statements that were made about uh, not having any development in or near the buffer zone. Um, so that, that may require some additional modifications to the footprint of the building. Thank you so much for your time today and, uh, and allowing us to ask additional questions. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for taking part. Um, 
Mr. Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I'm very pleased to see the changes in this latest version. I think that putting senior housing into the apartment building is an excellent improvement. And as others have said, this is going to certainly have some sort of positive effect on the traffic, particularly during peak hours. Um, it will also eliminate the threat of overcrowding at the Hardy School, although I understand that this is not within the purview of this board. That is correct. And as a senior, I am frankly excited about this type of housing being proposed for Arlington. And I have just a few specific comments. First, the four handicapped parking spaces meet the minimum state and federal requirements for a parking garage of this size, but it isn't realistic for a 126 unit facility for seniors. And I strongly urge that the number of accessible spaces in the garage be increased. The duplexes on Dorothy Road, I think are surprisingly tall. I recall that the original proposal, which included townhouses, um, they were only 32 feet high. And it looks like these duplexes are actually 42 feet in height above grade, not the 40 feet that was stated earlier. And this is just out of keeping with the neighborhood and is really far more than is needed for a two and a half story home. And I, I have to sort of wonder why the third floors are each 18 feet high. Uh, it seems like they could be cut down considerably and keep it more in the character of the neighborhood. And my major remaining concern is the impact of street flooding on Dorothy Road. The same problem has carried over from the previous version that the project effectively dams off the natural low elevation drainage path from Dorothy to the wetlands area. Now there is a provision in our bylaws, Title V, Section 11, that requires the posting of a bond to protect against flooding problems arising in the first five years. And I'd like to ask, is this um, bylaw provision among those that are being waived uh, for this project? Um, Ms. Kiefer, have you requested a waiver from that provision? I don't have the waiver list in front of me, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. I, uh, we can get back to Mr. Seltzer at the next hearing on that, though. Okay. Yeah, I think this is really important for the neighbors on Dorothy Road. Uh, they're the ones most likely to be affected. And if this project isn't going to be causing flooding, then the developers should be quite willing to comply with this local regulation to provide that extra protection into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Um, Ms. Shapiro Ide. Hi, it's uh, Marcy Shapiro Ide. Uh, I live on Lake. One of these days, I promise. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I live uh, 152 Lake Street, and I have some comments. And then my husband, we're also on the we're on the same Zoom. He has his own comments. Um, so first, uh, thank you for you know giving me an opportunity to speak. Um, first, I do want to say that. In general, I am not for anything being built here still. <laughs> that would be my first preference. Um, however, given that we're still talking about this, I will say I'm glad that to see the townhouses back. I still think that the townhouses or duplexes, whatever you wanna call them, they're still a little too large from what I've seen from some of the photos, 40 by 40, I don't know if it, 10% is too much, but if they could be shrunken down a little, just because people have built very large uh, two family homes in the place where these tiny little capes used to be on Dorothy Road doesn't mean they should still be that big. Um, I don't know why they would have to be over 2000 square feet of livable space per 
unit. So I'm just wondering if that's a possibility, if they could still be shrunken down a little bit, that would also allow for more backyard space for those uh, units, as well as, you know, a little more flexibility in parking and uh, potential grass space and other um, permeable surfaces around those townhouses or duplexes, whatever you want to call them. Um, I work with seniors and uh, work with senior housing a lot. So it's very hard, of course, for people to say no to senior housing. And I think that's a great idea. I would be curious to know um, if there could be a consideration to look at um, increasing the number of affordable units because although 40Bs call for a minimum of 25% of affordable units, I can tell you the biggest issue I deal with with seniors right now is housing and um, there isn't enough affordable and I don't think it basically it works out to like 16 more units um, on the independent living side, I guess, as well as the assisted living side. So I would like to respectfully ask that the developers consider making it all independent living and at least 50% affordable. Just because you only have to do 25 doesn't mean you are limited. You could increase it, I believe. Um, and I think that that would really be a true benefit to the community. And then I know this is still sort of early, but I'm wondering if there's any consideration to, if this would be a project where residency gives you preference to these units, meaning if you're already an Arlington resident that you have preference over people who don't already live in Arlington. Otherwise you will have seniors with more means um, moving to Arlington and essentially scooping up the units, um, you know, and so I, I'm just curious if there's been any thought about that. So those are my initial questions. Thank you. Um, I would ask Mr. Haverty about the, the residential preference question. Mr. Chairman, the board can impose a condition requiring a local preference of up to 70%, but that has to be acknowledging that ultimately it's the subsidizing agency that determines the amount of local preference that can be allowed. Um, so it doesn't guarantee that the board will be able to have a 70% local preference requirement. It's only an up to 70%. And okay. the, the town will have to provide evidence to the subsidizing agency supporting the need for that local preference. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I'd like to just put on the table for when we get to discussion of this, that local preferences are really quite controversial. When you have a local preference in a town that is racially as little diverse as our town is, you're essentially giving a preference to white people. And that's why we have the 70% and why you couldn't go above that. Uh, but there is at least some movement now. Brookline has recently reduced that percentage there. And I think we need to think long and hard about uh, just what we ought to do about that, given the demographics of our town. Thank you. Um, and then if I may, um, I, I, I don't think, I, I would certainly ask the applicant to consider the question about increasing the percentage of affordable units, but obviously that's not the question you can answer um, on the spot. Um, we'll take that under consideration. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Are there, were there further questions? Uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, this is Nicholas. I am also at 152 Lake yes, Street. Please. Oh, thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. So 152 Lake is the corner of Lake and Little John. So we're very close to this. Um, I really would like to thank the applicant for the new draft. I mean, it's clearly some uh, alternate thought has gone into this and, and that's very much appreciated. Um, I have two main comments and there's a few small questions uh, inside them. But uh, the first is on the, in the senior housing, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, well, you know, people won't need to drive or park because they'll take the red line. 
um, I think that makes a lot of assumptions about where the workers are going to come from. Because if I'm coming from Lexington or Woburn or Burlington or so many other places, there's no way I would take the red line. So you're assuming that everyone who works in the facility is going to come from downtown or from Cambridge or somewhere, which seems to be a little bit of a stretch. And the other thing is that even if they did that, it's a 16 minute walk back and forth uh, at a good pace uh, from the red line. And I don't think you can assume that you can walk through Thorndike Field. I think carving a path from constant walking through Thorndike Field would not uh, make the town and the people that use that field uh, for sports very happy about it. So you, know, you need to be careful about that. And when it gets to be the dead of winter, walking 16 minutes in the cold, uh, people are gonna end up driving. And the question is where are the workers going to park? So, you know, it seems like what's already very tight, uh, you know, for the parking uh, as it is, which actually leads me to my second point. So aside from where the staff is going to park and how that's going to work, I mean, it is shifting the traffic potentially. You're not going to have as much drive time, except the people that work in the facility are probably going to work regular hours. So there's that. But in any case, I can see that there may be a concession there that could change things. The, the other major concern I've had from the get-go is the scale of this whole thing. Um, every time we look at the plans, including these new plans, there is a lot of kind of pushing the limits and you see how tight things are stretched. I mean, on the, on the plot that's up on the screen right now for everyone, um, you know, you've got one of these things is not like the other for the duplexes, right? You've got five duplexes that have a sensible driveway and a nice layout and everything. And then the sixth one with the driveway kind of nestled in there just where it's going to fit. You know, so, well, you know, so it, it seems rather tight there. So that, that's one thing. And then I look at that emergency road and, you know, I'm looking at Little John, which is not a big street. And I've seen the fire trucks and emergency vehicles on that. And I'm looking this at this emergency road that looks kind of, the way it's drawn, it looks like the like a, a small sandy path, maybe wide enough for a smart car. Uh, and I don't understand how the three vehicles that always come with an emergency call in Arlington, being the ambulance, the fire truck, and the police services, are going to be able to get down that road if they need to and to turn around. And uh, it's a concern for me. Um, you know how wide it is, how you can turn around, how you can accommodate the three vehicles, and it is senior housing, so the probability of people needing to come is fairly high, I would think. Um, I'm also concerned by the same way about the truck access. So in the, in the front by that uh, turnaround, you know, it was said that there was a, a trash ramp and a delivery area. I, I don't know how in the world the truck gets there and turns around, but, but that's okay. Uh, and, and then to go a little further, if we go to, I think it was slide three that, that showed kind of the 3D uh, rendering of, of what everything looks like. And this is a nice picture, but I think it's unfortunately a, a little bit uh, misleading. Uh, to me, it, it looks like those houses are back about 300 feet, you know, or I don't know how far, but there's some distance from where they actually would be. The forced perspective on that makes it seem as though those are barely the same height as the brick building there that I know is barely over two stories. It's two stories with a gabled roof. And, you know, looking at this, I know that those buildings, the, the duplexes are, would be quite close to that. And I have a hard time thinking they'd really look that small. <laughs> uh, and even the car that looks like to be a, a, a small sedan uh, does not appear to be full scale at the distance that's actually covered there. Uh, so I'm a little bit concerned about, uh, again, it's just that it's the, it's the actual massiveness of this that appears to keep being hidden. And things are shown in a way that make it seem like it's not as big as you think it is. And, and there's plenty of room, but then everything is kind of uh, squished together. And even if you go back to, to slide two, um, I, I'm not sure about how the, the size of the townhomes, uh, sorry, the duplexes here really compare with the size of the duplexes across the street. Um, so th those are all my comments. Thank, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I did wanna just briefly ask uh, Mr. Hessian if he could just explain the, the um, how the road that wraps around the back side of the property, how that's made up. Um, All right, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the, in the previous uh, color sketch that was on the screen, um, you saw the brown sandy, you know, looking color. And that was really highlighting 
you know, the, the por six foot wide porous asphalt path. And then on either side of that is a reinforced earth um, material that provides, you know, proper width uh, emergency ve vehicle access. And, you know, the comment about the police, the ambulance and the fire truck needing to get around there, um, you know, they would need to access the site, but the access around the rear would really be only in the event of needing to fight a fire from the rear of the building or for, you know, some type of emergency. So that would really be for a single vehicle and it, it's designed for full circulation around the building so that, um, you know, there's no turnaround area designed in, but if they came in Little John, they would be able to exit out back on the east side of the town, you know, the easternmost town home, as uh, Scott's showing with his um, cursor there. Great, thank you. And we did, and um, actually, Mr. Chairman, sorry, we did submit um, previously uh, truck turning templates using the fire truck um, as the design vehicle, showing that the fire truck could make those movements. Thank you very much. Um, moving on, um, Ms. Roberts. Oops, did I lose Ms. Roberts? Did that go too long for her? I do not see her name right now. Okay, if she comes back. Um, uh, Jim Hakim. Yes, thank you very much, uh, George Michael Akeem, 10 Edith Street. Um, I want to say, I just want to thank the applicant for uh, these plans, which while uh, I think there are still some significant issues with them, they certainly much more closely approach um, a, a reasonable plan. Um, you know, I share the concerns about uh, a fire truck turning into that emergency road, um, how it's going to manage a turn at that angle um, with perhaps cars parked along the north side of Dorothy Road. Um, that's certainly something. Um, uh, additionally, um, the concern was brought up about um, this being uh, a senior living um, building zoned as senior living, uh, hopefully in perpetuity. Um, I think that I know that uh, it was brought up that it would have to go before the board again if the usage uh, were to change. Um, but I think the the scope of this um, being a senior facility um, is definitely um, more beneficial in terms of traffic as well as um, the uh, potential overcrowding of Hardy School that was discussed earlier. This would certainly avoid that. Um, so I think that um, the perpetuity of this zoning usage for this building would have to be assured. Um, the other thing I just want to bring up, I know we're talking about this project um, in terms of the building. Um, I just want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the massive amounts of garbage in the woods belonging to the, the Mugar family, uh, who are also, you know, uh, the, the applicant is working on behalf of, uh, and making sure that the town and, and the ZBA doesn't, you know, lose sight of that. And, uh, and I would suggest and strongly recommend a prerequisite to breaking ground on this building, as I have mentioned before, needs to be that the woods are cleaned completely uh, and all debris, all trash, all human waste uh, is removed and, and the woods are restored to their natural state. Um, so that's what I have to say. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, just before the next speaker, um, it's been mentioned a couple of times the, the question about uh, crowding in the schools. Um, so the, the discussion of crowding of schools is an implication that that families would be unwelcome and families are a protected group under federal law. So we, we really encourage people not to discuss school crowding as a um, as something that would that uh, that should be considered in this decision. So I thank you for that. Um, Mr. McCabe. Hello, can you hear me? I can, Mr. McCabe. That's great, thank you. And I thank you very much for letting me come along. Uh, my first question is uh, on the 
independent living and the assisted living, I know in the first developments, they were studio apartments, one bedroom apartments, two bedroom apartments, and three bedroom apartments available. With uh, independent living and assisted living, what are the apartments going to look like? Let me go ahead and forward that um, to Gwen and Art. Yeah, the, um, the assisted living uh, will have a prominence of studios, which are about uh, a little less than 500 square feet. Uh, and that's, that's kind of an industry standard. There will be some one bedrooms in assisted living as well. And for independent living, it swings the other way where there's a predominance of ones with a some limited number of twos. And that would be the mix. There'd be no micro units. Uh, there'd be no threes. There would be no three bedroom units at all within this development? I believe the, um, the duplex units are all three bedroom. Is that correct? Okay. I'm just the apartments behind. I understand the the townhouse duplex, whatever you want to call them, will be three bedrooms, but the building behind it, four stories high, they won't have three bedroom apartments. That is correct. Okay. My next question is, and it's just off the charts, it's a little bit, uh, what about uh, snow removal from this whole area? Who is going to be responsible for it? And where is the snow going to be gone? So when it starts to melt, it doesn't flood people's cellars. Um, Mr. Hessian, can I ask you that question? Sure, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, at this conceptual level, we haven't located the snow removal, but it, as we had shown in the previous 172 unit, we had snow storage areas located off the front courtyard entrance um, and off the surface parking lot on the west side of the main drive aisle here. Um, you could see for the duplexes, it would be just like people needing to clear their driveways on the duplexes across the street. There's green space yard areas for that, essentially for each side of the duplex themselves. For the senior li living building, there's, um, you know, as Gwen described, the boulevard entrance up to the cul-de-sac drop-off area. There's a, quite a bit of green space available for snow storage and then the lawn and you know the open space on the west side of the main driveway near those uh, four parallel parking spaces provides a, a great opportunity for some snow storage there in the in the winter season when that that area is not being used for outdoor um, use and recreation. So the the storage unit by the uh, vegetable gardens or whatever you want to call them will be used for snow and the people who live right next door to it will have to take care of that if it does melt into the yard. Uh... I'm sorry, did you hear me? Hello? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite understand or follow I... that, that question. Uh, the, the question is that you were saying that the part of the snow storage will go into the what would possibly be the vegetable gardens or something like that. And now if you throw a lot of snow in that area, where is it going to melt? It's going to melt into the residential home right next to the development. Is that correct or not correct? Uh, you don't know. We can locate the snow storage and we can grade those lawn areas so that it slopes and grades away from that. Um, I believe that's Mr. I'm sorry, who's home on Little John Street. Um, I'm sorry, who is speaking? This is John Hessian. Proceed, Mr. Hessian. Okay. That, 
as we can locate that snow storage so that it will not impact in the future when it melts any uh, adjacent abutters that are not a part of this project. Thank you. So we, we could take that. I'll just we go could... two more things before you cut me off, Mr. Klein, because you did it last time. Is one, there are a lot of assumptions, assumptions about vehicle use by the elderly and by the people who be working there. I would like to know why they are assumptions and not numbers, direct numbers, yes or no. 33 cars, 22 cars, two trucks, this or that. Everything is an assumption. We're assuming that the workers will be using the red line and that the elderly in the housing will not go out during the peak traffic hours. Why are these assumptions being made? Um, so on the traffic one- can, uh, can you speak up a little bit? I can't- I'm, Oh, sorry, Mr. McCabe. Um, if I could ask uh, uh, Scott to address you. the question about traffic. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, so again, we uh, we're still working on the on the traffic and the and the um, and some of the assumptions associated with the with the traffic analysis. Um, I don't think that every that that we're saying that everyone is going to take the T uh, that works there, um, but I think that it's likely that some people are going to take the T. I think there's there's some people that are going to use public transportation to get to the site. And I, and I think, you know, there's also some, uh, that there, you know, we need to do a little more, uh, a little more uh, research into how many uh, people might be employed there at the site, the assisted living side. Yes. Because, you know, the, it, it's not like, you know, the, it's not like a nursing home. It's not like, um, no, it, it, it's, not, it's not like a hospital. It's not like there's, you know, there's, you know, there could be, there could be five, I'm, I'm, I am generalizing here, but there, there could be, there could be five or 10 or, or two people working there at certain times. So I think there'd be more than two. Uh, that's fine. But, you know, the, the fact is that uh, will we have to do some additional research on those types of numbers to be able to answer your question intelligently. Now, I, I think that, um, you know, it, we're not, we're, we're certainly not saying that all the seniors are going to leave, you know, when, when the ones that are driving, that they're going to leave during, um, you know, during off-peak time periods. I think that that also, however, is a likely situation. If, if you don't have to get somewhere for seven, eight, nine o'clock in the morning, and you don't have to come back home between four or five o'clock, then, you know, then why would you? So, you know, and, and I do think that there's a less, there's a lower traffic demand and traffic impact associated with this, with this type of use. And it's not that, you know, it's not that we're, you know, we, we just haven't done the analysis yet. It's not that, that we're not doing it. And it's, and all the numbers are going to be verified by the town's consultant anyway. So, uh, so those answers are to come. We're, we're just not there yet. Okay, so there's no analysis being done, but you have these uh, diagrams of, of things that are going up. And that's what I don't understand, why you can go ahead with these diagrams and these other questionable things haven't been looked at considerably so you can say yes or no. I, that's what I'd like to hear, either yes or no. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to say a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, I didn't mean to give the impression that we were counting on um, the employees to be using the red line. I was just saying that the proximity, reasonable proximity to the red line is, is something that is, would be available. And, but in fact, the numbers that we've used for the parking spaces um, were derived 
from uh, the data and the trap, the parking, the, the tables that the traffic institute, Scott has them. Um, there, there are real uh, projections based on assisted living and independent living. And we, we use the maximum number of, of parking spaces uh, in the garage for, uh, you know, the, from, from the tables that were, were given. And those numbers included both the employees and the residents. So that's, that's one piece of data that is, uh, has been generated from, from the professional uh, uh, records that are out there. Um, it's not an assumption. Okay, what projections are these coming from? What, what professional organization are they be coming from? Yeah, I, I can I can answer that, Gwen. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I yes, appreciate it. Yeah, so, sure. So it's so it's the Institute of Traffic Engineers Parking Generation Manual, the fifth edition, and and this is for uh, for assisted living and for uh, senior housing. So that that those numbers we were able to run to make sure that we had enough parking available on site to accommodate the expected demand. And we do. Okay. I, I guess just one last thing, and I'm a little upset with Miss, I forget what her name is, the, the leader of the group, that if she believes that the ZBA does not allow this situation to go on, is that she's going to jump right back onto the 176 and shove it down our throat. And I think that's a very unprofessional way to do business. And I think she might want to word it a different way somewhere in the future. Hi, Mr. McKee. If you want to speak, Stephanie I'd be glad Kiefer. to speak to her. This is Stephanie Kiefer. And I, the board had asked the applicant at the last hearing, as we understood it, to explore the, the uh, reintroduction of the townhouses. And, um, and so we've done that and we've done that as, as we've stated on the conceptual level. And I, I think there's been a lot of thought that's put into it, but obviously we haven't been able to answer every question. Um, and it is, it takes a lot of um, time and expense to um, further engineer and, and develop our plans. And so it's a, it's a fair request, I think, of an applicant to ask a board for um, their input as to whether we're going in the right direction or whether we should go back to what we had before. And I think that, um, you know, perhaps you um, misconstrued what I was asking, but I, it, it's a very fair, um, this is very expensive and, and time consuming to put this forward. And so um, we want the board's feedback on this. Is this, is this the direction that they would like us to proceed? And, and if they say thumbs up, then we're happy to do that. I okay. hope that um, addresses and, your concern. And both to Mr. McCabe and to, and to Ms. Keeper, that was certainly the the way that I had perceived it, that you were asking us if this was the way to keep proceeding. And if not, then we would be proceeding along the prior plan um, and trying to finalize on that. So I, with I the threat that it would go right back to 176. 172 or 176. Uh, 172, 176, 174. I'm not sure which exactly. one it is. Yeah. I'm getting confused with the numbers, but I appreciate mm -hmm. your time. Christopher, and I hope the best, and hopefully everything will work out well. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you, Mr. McCabe. Yeah, well, appreciate that. Um, Mr. Gryan. Hi, this is Anita Gryan. Oh, beg your pardon. Okay. He logged in first. Um, okay. I, most of the questions I had, I think we've talked about. I won't repeat myself. Uh, we're at forty-seven Birch Street. So I'll, I'll look at my questions here and ask the ones that I don't think have been raised. Um, most of the discussion so far about the frontage has regard, been re in regard to Dorothy Road and the townhouses or duplexes. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about what would the view we have as abutters from the, set, from the eastern side, pretty much all the existing abutters um, of the actual property are not gonna be looking at townhouses, we'll be looking at whatever is facing east um what do you mm -hmm. see that i see that there is a woodland restoration mentioned 
Um, and you also mentioned that there would be cementitious siding on the duplexes. What kind of woodland restoration would we be looking at? And what type of uh, out exterior finish is expected on the building? Thank you for um, those questions. Uh, Noyce, did you want to address the, those questions? Um, I, thank you. Um, uh, we have been thinking a, a lot about about the conservation area that's close to 12, 12 more than 12 acres of land and um, we we would very much like to have a conversation with the town about how best to approach this we understand that there's that there is um, you know work that needs to be done and has been already mentioned earlier this evening about uh, cleaning up from from the habitations that have been there. And um, we're also aware that that uh, there's a real, um, uh, I guess, concern that the some of the some of the uh, invasive species that are growing there, you know, might be mitigated and native species brought back. These are all things that we, we, we consider as um, really uh, quite wonderful prospects for the land, but it needs to be worked out with people in the town and the Conservation Commission and so on. And, and we have, uh, as I think some people know, we've, we've had conversations with various entities, including uh, some that are quite interested in working with us. So, um, there's a lot of conversation and a lot of timing and so on that needs to be needs to be worked out, but we're we're up for for um, uh, seeing that the property will be unrecognizable in, in its beauty in in, a, <laughs> in in the future years. And has there been much thought about the cladding for the um, the assisted living and uh, independent living building? You want to talk about that? Well, I think the uh, the cladding would be consistent. Uh, with the assisted living building would would be clad the way, for example, the buildings uh, across Route Two are with uh, panels uh, and clapboard with trim. And the townhouses, uh, the duplexes would be uh, the same materials. They'd be uh, panels with vertical uh, battens. They'd be clapboard. Uh, and uh, panels even without the vertical battens to try to get so it. basically a residential type finish it wouldn't look too institutional or too industrial that, that's correct we would we would want to you know spend more time analyzing the neighborhood and the different materials used in the neighborhood because the whole point here is, is to have those, uh, those six duplexes uh, blend in with the neighborhood uh, I think hype has been mentioned a little bit. We can take a look at that. Um, one thing, just so you know, <laughs> there are so many uh, decisions that have to be made in something like this. One of the things we've done is, as you know, we've thought about modular construction. And uh, these, the townhouses are also modular construction, different technology, uh, but still modular. And there's actually three extra feet in height because of the modular construction. So that's one thing that uh, we could even think about and look at is, is building those buildings a different way. But we thought modular would be good because it, it's much faster. You can do a building like this in a matter of three months, four months. If it's modular, it might take six or eight months if it's uh, uh, conventionally built. And, and you, did you say both the duplexes and the main building would be all modular units? That's our intention. That, that, Again, is one of those details we have to work out. Uh, we're used to doing buildings that are multifamily with using modular construction, and uh, the, the assisted living projects that we've done were not modular construction. So, can that be married? We, we, we need to look into that. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Grant, anything further? No, everything else I had on my list has already been asked. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Giannolio? Uh, yes, can you hear me? We can. 
Hi, thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to ask a question for the presentation. I'm 85 uh, Dorothy record, Road, need, so. Uh, beg your pardon, just for the record, I need your name and address. Diego Janolio, 85 Dorothy Road. Thank you so much, please proceed. Yeah, so I'm really at the corner, Little John and Dorothy Road facing this project. And um, I couldn't agree more with Mrs. Kiefer that there's a lot of time and effort that has been put into this. So I think there are something that should be very clear at this point. And uh, in particular, I'm referring to the uh, potential for flooding. Because in the whole presentation, one thing that is not clear is the basements. So the basements for the duplexes seems to be there, but it's not clear if they're going to be actually put in place or not. And if they are, how deep they're going to be. And I say this because I move into the uh, duplex on the other side that was built in uh, 2017. The bottom of the garage, so the floor of my garage, is actually less than four feet from uh, 80, from the Toronto Road street level. And uh, we experienced severe uh, uh, flooding. So we had the sump pumps running all the time. And so at this point, I think we should have a very good understanding of the water flow, how much water is expected, what is the drainage system, is it going to be a French drainage system, some pumps, and what is the percentage of water that's going to be displaced by this system, how comfortable are we that it's going to be able to manage it, and uh, also in the future, considering also the uh, potential of uh, global warming, uh, how can we handle all the water coming down? spilling down right in that place where the project is. So I had a question, so does the CBA has a good understanding of the applicant management of water for the flooding and does the applicant have all those, uh, the information? And then the other question I have is about the uh, module. So I'm assuming this comes down with trucks and uh, we have a lot of wires that correspond to power, electricity, as well as cable at each intersection on uh, Little John. So is the plan to remove those wires and how are they going to provide power to the neighborhood during the time of construction? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Thornton, I, I believe you've addressed a similar question in the past, but could you just speak a little bit about um, sort of the size of the trucks and their ability to access the neighborhood? Yeah, so, um, so the trucks, uh, and, and we're not, let me back up. So, um, uh, at the at the at the risk of uh, of you know putting off the question, uh, we haven't we haven't gone into the uh, and maybe Art could speak to this is uh, the the type of construction um, if the if the modular construction is still contemplated, um, but those those vehicles um, can. Uh, if if that's the case, those vehicles can get uh, back to the to the site and and are able to um, to pull into the site and to unload their their materials and then get go back out to Little John. Um, the 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 utility lines there's there's technically uh, supposed to be 16 feet of clearance between. The surface of the roadway and any power lines, uh, and and the vehicles should not be any higher, any taller than thirteen point five feet. They should be they should be below that. Uh, so so there should be no issues with height with the vehicles coming in. Um, and this is getting kind of ahead of ahead of ourselves. But but when we would get to the point where we would. Uh, be looking at sort of the, the precondition inspection for uh, for uh, for construction management plan. One thing we would probably do is, or one thing that we would do is, we would have an arborist come there and and um, and take a look to see if there's any any uh, selective tree pruning that might need to take place that's out in the in the middle of the street to um, to make sure that there's. There's, there's no damage that, that uh, occurs to these trees when the trucks are coming in. But again, that's, that's if the modules, uh, if the modular construction is, is used for this type of development and, uh, and, and if those trucks are required to come back here. If, 
If not, if it's a, if it's a, a WB67 or a large type tractor trailer, that vehicle can can access uh, without really without any issues coming in off of Lake Street onto Little John and then right into the site. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then I had a question just to sort of follow up with Mr. Hessian. Um, so, in your invest in your investigations, do you look at surface questions of surface flow and how water is moving specifically from off-site areas into the site? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, we do. We look at um, we look at if there's any water contributing to you know the this project site, and and even more importantly, we look at any water uh, if there's any grades on this project site that actually drain out into Dorothy Road or onto any abutting properties, and 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 are you know. Mm -hmm. We have to accept water that flows onto our site from offsite, but we have a responsibility to not increase flows from our site onto, onto others. Okay. Thank you. And I, and I believe um, the, the most recent iteration of uh, rainfall calculations that you guys have been using, you've been using the NOAA 14 plus data, which is um, what the town is starting to use uh, but is in excess of what the the current regulations are. Is that correct? No, you mentioned the NOAA 14 plus. Our our drainage calculations have been using the Cornell data, which is what's required under the town's wetlands regulations. Mm -hmm. um, but as part of Beta's peer review, or or you know, I believe the board asked Beta to to look at our drainage system if we use the NOAA 14 plus and the drainage system worked with the exception of the 100 year storm, there was a little bit of surcharging um, on the subsurface infiltration uh, basin in only the 100 year storm event. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ginoli, did you have a follow up? Just wondering about the basements. Are they going to be basements or not? Because those, I assume, will form a dam that would not allow water to go where it's supposed to go. Okay. It's currently going. Ms. Noyce, can you address that question? Um, well, th the basements would be um, in the same, you know, on, just underneath the house, which was, would not allow at least surface water. To go, you know, uh, by um, if, if if you're thinking about groundwater, um, there's there's 22 feet, I believe, between the houses um, that would that would provide a, a passage for groundwater to to uh, to move. Um, the basements. You know, as it, we've, we've said, we, we were thinking we might have partial basements and they would not be, um, there would, they would not be below the, the entrances, the, the stairs to the basement would uh, not be uh, uh, lower than 11 feet or possibly 12 feet uh, height so that they, they wouldn't naturally flood. And I understand that, that many of the driveways um, in the area do uh, are subject to flooding because they go, you know, they go right, the water flows right down into them. So we, we, we've heard about these problems, you know, every time we have a, a hearing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we uh, have been working to uh, really address the, the water situation. And, and that's what John Heston has been talking to. So the, the basements would be built, you know, if we presume we have basements and I, we think there's every reason to do that. Uh, we have, as builders, we've, we've uh, been using the, the most uh, stringent kind of construction methodologies to keep the basements dry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next on the list, 
Um, Ms. Ingalls? Yes, hello. I'm Martha Ingalls. I live at 148 Herbert Road. And uh, I have a couple of small points to make. One is I see on Google Maps that this is the the this side of Dorothy Road is currently zoned for five duplexes. Um, if we if we gave up that sixth duplex um, at the corner of Little John, that would allow for a wider entrance for those emergency vehicles we were concerned about. And my other thing that I wanted to say was, um, can we zoom out a little bit on this slide? Or uh, yeah, we're on slide two. I want to see the outdoor socializing spaces over to the left. My concern is that those are very close to route two with a lot of pollution um, and which will not be good for the vegetable plots and also a lot of noise, which will not, not be good for socializing in the lawn and the, the flower garden. And the solution that I want to suggest for that is that the uh, assisted living building be constructed um, such that they can put a roof garden on top. And that would, um, it would provide more outdoor socializing space for residents, but more importantly, it, it would also absorb more rainwater. That's all I had to say. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, could I, um, uh, Chairman, <laughs> Chairman uh, Klein, I have a comment about the, the proximity that- Yes, please. Um, if, if we could get a, a bigger plan, what, what may be um, somewhat, um, I, I'm not sure where Scott, if Scott can find one, but, but um, the distance between the, the, this drawing and route two is, is um, there's a fairly considerable, um, uh, maybe I'm not sure who has the best drawing of that, but anyway, there, it, there, it, there is a, that's okay. So this is an older plan. This is Scott uh, Vlasak. This is an older plan, Gwen, but it shows the distance. Okay. So route two is, is, at the very bottom uh, of the of that line, and there's um, there's property uh, that that rectangular shape of property there is owned by the state and does give um, a certain amount of buffer area uh, between the property and Route Two. Just to clarify that question. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, uh, next, um, uh, Ms. Fredman. Hi, thank you very much. Um, my name is Lisa Fredman. Oh, I'm getting an echo over here. Um, and I live at 63 Mott Street. Um, First, I want to say I was so hopeful at the last ZBA meeting when a couple of the members talked about coming to a compromise about how to develop Thorndike Place. And I sort of have been focusing my whole time on thinking about the environmental impact and also on flooding and traffic. On Mott Street, my basement still floods. And I think any sort of major building is going to continue to create increased flooding on all of the streets, not just Dorothy Street or Little John Road, but even on those of us who live as far away as Mott Street. So one of the thoughts I had about compromise, which I think is so important for our neighborhood and our town and our relationship with you as the developers is to think how to be as minimalistic as possible and how to retain 
as much as we can of having this place be environmentally sound and preventing flooding. So one thought is just to stay with the proposal for the townhouses. And the other reason why I said that is that I've had a lot of experience <laughs> both um, uh, personally as a caregiver to my father and professionally doing research on older adults, older adults living in long-term care facilities. And now I work with quite a few people who do home care services for dependent elderly adults. Assisted living is essentially reserved for people who are not independent. They have limitations in activities of daily living and in cognitive functioning. They usually require at least one home aid or personal care aid visit a day. People in independent living, my father was in independent living for 12 years, often are able to stay in independent living because they or their families arrange for them to get personal care services or home aid services up to 24 hours a day. We, and, and I also want to add that living in Arlington, people who live in, if this assisted living or independent living, living facility is developed, people's families will visit probably multiple times a week. A lot of times it might not be at nine o'clock in the morning, but it certainly will be in the afternoon after work. All of those things will affect traffic into the area and will impact parking along Dorothy Road, Little John Road, and all of the adjacent roads because there will not be enough parking that you're proposing in this development. And I sort of feel a little used by proposing that changing the apartment building to an independent and um, assisted living facility will reduce all of these problems. It will still contribute to having an impact on the land and on flooding and probably also on traffic. And so I really would encourage us to go back to where we were at the last CBA meeting, thinking about a compromise that truly benefits people in our neighborhood. And to me, that compromise would be just restricting the development to the townhouses. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, you're on mute. Thank you for that. Um, so there are no other uh, hands that are currently raised. Um, I was gonna just give a minute here if there were others who wish to raise their hand at this time. Um, but also to get back to um, uh, Ms. Chapnick, I know Mr. Heston was looking for, was trying to find a document for you. Um, has that been resolved? Mr. Uh, Chairman, I, I can um, try to speak to that. What I wanted to make sure was that I had, you know, the full context of that January um, plan. And I have a, let me open, I have, <laughs> I have too many, uh, too many windows and, and screens open. Um, so if you bear with me and, and try to follow along. So that the January submission was not a full set of revised site plans, civil engineering site plans. What it was, was it was five 
plans from the plan set that were an attachment to the um, response to beta's stormwater review. So, and that drawing C105, which is the grading and drainage plan in response to beta's comments, um, we had adjusted some grading uh, where they had pointed out that um, we had a couple of minor issues and we adjusted some of the, the drain, you know, the drainage structures and the, the connections to the building. Um, on that drawing, there's a dashed line that is outside of the footprint of the residential portion of the building. It extends outside of the residential footprint to the north towards Dorothy, and then in the rear, that courtyard area um, where the you know, where, where we were discussing the, um, the, the, the work in the aura on the south, south side of the building, southwest side of the building. So that's, that's just one sheet that was revised from the November 3rd set. If you go to the November 3rd set, which, and also the November 3rd architectural drawings, label what that dashed line is. They labeled, they, they show that the garage footprint is outside of the building footprint. So it, it, this is, that type of site plan element gets labeled on the layout of materials plan and not on the grading and drainage plan. So it, I think the miscommunication, if you will, was that this was a, you know, one sheet out of five that was prepared to just specifically respond to, um, you know, uh, the, those drainage comments from, from Beta's peer review. And the, the footprint of the building and the garage had not changed at, at all um, since that November 3rd full submission um, of both the full site plans. And, and that's really, I think, where that maybe it, it got lost is in, in trying to respond to comments um, we tried to keep the revisions limited to just what was what was necessary. But um, if you refer back to the November 3rd plans, both the site plans and the architectural plans, you'll see that the, the garage is that dashed line um, and it was labeled back then and had, had not changed with the January. So I apologize if that caused any, any uh, confusion, but it was in no way meant to be a misrepresentation or trying to, you know, for lack of better words, to sneak one by anybody. Um, I, so I, I, I apologize you know, in trying to, trying to be responsive to the comments. Um, yeah, I, maybe we, we didn't think that it might be um, misread or misinterpreted for another purpose. Mr. Or, Chairman. So. Mr. Hanlon. Um, if that being, I mean, I, I think it's clear that a miscommunication took place um and but it's also clear what the facts are now that it was true then and it's true now that there's an intrusion uh of the building into the um uh, into the aura uh it's also true that we, we now know that in previously commenting on the earlier version of the application the CONCOM was not aware of that and did not take that into account in its earlier comments and will almost certainly be interested in taking it into account in its comment on the revised plan. And it seems to me, Mr. Chairman, that that that's kind of where we are on that right now is that you can't just assume that whatever they said before yeah. would apply here because there was a mistake of fact and it will be up to them to decide what to make of it. Uh, and I'm just assuming that everybody has been proceeding in the utmost good faith here and it's very complicated and there's lots of things going on. But nevertheless, there's a substantive issue that's emerged and that uh, uh, if we proceed forward, as I imagine we will uh, on this trail, uh, and even if we don't, uh, that ComCom is going to have to review what it did in light of what it now understands about the proposal. Mr. Chairman, if, if I could respond to that. Um, 
please. So in, in response to Mr. Hanlon, I, I, I do want to say that I, I do know that it was presented and I'm not, I, I don't recall it have to go back through, you know, uh, my notes and, and potentially, you know, the recordings of these meetings, but it was, it was presented most likely at the Conservation Commission, but probably also as part of the ZBA when we, when we presented those revised plans on November, the, the November 3rd plans that it was pointed out that there was a, a small, and I, I'd have to go back to my notes, 270 something square foot um, intrusion of the building into the very outer 10 or so feet, 13 feet, I believe is the exact distance um, at the at the greatest um, of the building into that aura. So I, I, I just wanna put it on, the record that it's not new information. It was presented in the past. Um, and, you know, it was fact that it was presented and it, has, it hasn't changed. And um, so I, I just wanted to, you know, make that clear that- Mr. Chairman, was, what I'm trying to get across is that, it, it, is that it, from where we are right now, it doesn't really matter. It's now, We've now been at this for three hours and 18 minutes, and I don't even know that this is the longest time. There are lots of details that were presented and that didn't stick. I believe Ms. Chapnick, when she says that the CONCOM, if they heard this, did not, did not focus on it and did not assume it. And we need the advice that we're, and we'll get the advice from them as to what is to do now, even though it hasn't changed. Um, and it seems to me that, that at this point, it would be great to leave the who shot John and who's responsible for what and just realize that a miscommunication occurred and that will have to be remedied and as we go forward. Absolutely. And can I just say um, thank you, Patrick and John. And I, I think it is a miscommunication and maybe it is even mine and I have to go back to the commission and find out if they, they felt that, that everything, you know, that they had commented on this. There's been so many iterations um, that I am not comfortable with, with, with saying that right now. So, so let's just take it as it is right now and, and move forward mm -hmm. this way. And I appreciate um, you, pointing, you pointing that out and I appreciate Patrick's comment. Thank you. Thank you I should Chapman. say that when I said um, who shot John, I didn't mean John Hessian in particular. I, <laughs> I, I didn't take it that way, Mr. Hanlon, thank you. <laughs> um, so in the intervening time here, uh, we haven't had anyone else raise their hand, so I'm going to go ahead and formally close the public hearing portion of tonight's meeting. So having closed the public comment period, so there's a couple of th things that are before the board at the moment. Um, so one is the, the request from the applicant to get you know, a little bit better direction from us as to whether they're proceeding in the path that we want them to follow. Um, if we want them to, uh, to revert back to what they were pursuing before or whether um, you know, we want them to, to keep along this path, but there are certain things we want them to keep an eye on um, moving forward. And it sounds like we're, you know, based on the comments we've been receiving tonight, um, that we're very, very much uh, likely in that third category. Um, you know, going back to the, the original comments of the board before the public comment period, you know, I definitely feel this is a much better plan in terms of keeping with. Do you want to um, run? With a lot of the discussion that we had earlier, um, and. You know that it that it does a good job. I think now of meeting the neighborhood, um, and I am still trying to digest exactly what it means to have a large um, assisted and independent living building um, in this portion of the neighborhood. I, but um, it sounds like it. There are definitely some advantages to um, to pursuing this rather than. Um, sort of open open apartments um 
but the, we've also received a lot of a lot of comments um, from both the public and from members of the board um, about certain aspects of this that I think um, it would be good to have uh, reviewed. Um, one of them obviously is this is this question of of the the portion of the building that's in the aura. And is there a is there a straightforward way of addressing that um, that preserves the aura, or is it something that we really that you know the applicant feels they cannot get away from, and that they are really um, limited to having to to maintain that intrusion? Um, and I think the I think the board and I think the um, the chair of the conservation commission has been has been clear that this is something that they that should be looked at. Um, or will be looked at by their specific commission. Um, I think that the, there's been a couple of questions certainly raised about the the basements in the um, in the duplex units and whether those pose a risk to the um, to those who would be purchasing those units. Um, while I think I'll, you know, as, as some people said, you know, there. A lot of it, so there are definitely issues with water that comes down the driveways and into the basements of the houses that have basement garages. Um, I think there's also others who have, who have said that you know they have basements that are not garages, but that the water comes up through the basement into uh, you know through the the foundations and through the floor slab into the basement, um, and that that pressure, that water pressure, is something that you know not only would be a concern to the new project. To the to the new duplexes, but the dis, but that displacement would that be an issue for other people um, in the neighborhood? So I you know encourage you to think a little bit more about the the necessity of the basements and whether they are um, you know how to how to make sure that if they are included in the project that they're included in a way that um, that they're not a risk for the for the people owning them and that you know it, it's clear that you know, they will be able to maintain their water tightness. Um, and there's been some concern, a, a little bit of concern, not as much, I think, about the, the elevation of the garage level um, in the larger building. Um, certainly, I think higher is better. It is certainly now above the what we understand the water table to be. Um, and hopefully, you know, that'll, that will work out. Um, and then I know there there was there has a couple of people had sort of mentioned the sort of the natural flow of water in the neighborhood right now where this site is undeveloped. That I don't know if there is a lack of um, drains in the street or just sort of what the condition is, but it certainly it has been described by multiple people that water flows through the neighborhood and then off the edge of the roadway on Dorothy into the woods, and that. That is sort of the natural flow pattern right now, and if you know, I think it would be good for us to understand if that really is the flow pattern. Um, you know, is it is it just that there are no street drains in that locale, um, or is it you know what exactly is going on? Um, and see if that's something that need and see if there's that's something that ne would need an intervention as a part of of, of uh, whatever is being proposed. Um, just going back to the members of the board, are there other concerns that you have raised or that you have heard raised tonight that you want to emphasize? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, <clears throat> there's still, there's some basic blocking and tackling, which I think that both Mr. Hessian and Mr. Thornton said was much easier than it was before. Um, but one of them has to do with traffic. There's a hunch based on some evidence, but not all the study that Mr. Thornton thought needed to be done as to what the actual traffic picture would be with the, with the change in use that we have there. Um, you know, and for every sort of basis for the hunch, there's somebody who has a counter hunch. And at this point, there's research that needs to be done that Mr. Thornton mentioned before, uh, and that we shouldn't forget. Uh, similarly, uh, Mr. Mr. Hessian had pointed out before that the management of the stormwater 
or that stormwater management is easier now that it's not as cramped a site as it was before. Um, and I'm glad it makes this job easier because it still is a job that needs doing. The flowing of water here is so important to everyone that making sure we've done everything we can uh, to cross all the I's, dot all the T's and so forth um, is, is something that, that we can't neglect to do. So that kind of work uh, needs to be done as well. Um, there may be a little bit of, of, of fine tuning. I, I at least raised a question a little bit about the height uh, of the townhouse units. And I think in the course of the discussion, there were a number of things individually, maybe not very large, but there certainly were things to be thinking about <clears throat> and seeing whether there's, there's a kind of fine tuning that, that will, if we've, if we've got everything in the right shape now, which I I'm not going to say for sure that we do, but if we did, there's still a little bit of sanding necessary maybe to, to fit this into the neighborhood and its surroundings in the way one would like to do. Um, there was lots of, ex of expression of a willingness by uh, uh, Gwen and Arthur to do that. And, uh, uh, but it, in a, if we're going to have a checklist, we need to keep those kinds of issues on the checklist as well. Thank you. Mr. Revelak? Yeah, I, I have a, a few brief uh, items regarding the, so first I'll preface this by saying that I live along the Alewife Brook in a hundred year floodplain. Um, and yes, my house does occasionally flood and it's it's not groundwater that comes up through the basement. It's it's overland that forms a big sort of a pond uh, in, in the land that's behind my house. But, you know, living in that sort of situation, I've become a very... I've really warmed up to the idea of uh, buildings in floodplains that are elevated on piles. Um, and I'm, you know, that might be a more practical, um, a, a more practical approach in this environment, just forego the basement altogether. Um, you know, I just put that out there for consideration. There are not many buildings in East Arlington that do this, but if you walk along Alewife Brook, you will, you will see a few. Um, regarding, um, you know, and the other thing I'd just like to mention, well, be, see, with, with the time as it is, I'll keep it short. Uh, during the public comment period, I did, don't believe I re heard anyone say, we should go back to the uh, the 176 unit apartment. So uh, I, I'm likely to, I concur with my fellow board members that this is an improvement. Um, and I would like to see us uh, continue down this path. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Revelai. Um, so I think, I think I can certainly say on behalf of the board that the board is very, um, you know, views this this new plan uh, quite favorably and would like to see um, some further refinements on it, um, especially in light of the, the comments that were brought up this evening um, and sort of the comments that were uh, reiterated um, since the close of the, the public comment period. Um, I would ask Ms. Kiefer whether this sort of gives her the, the direction she was hoping to receive I think that it does, and uh, we appreciate your, your thoughtfulness um, and, and feedback on this. Um, good. Um, so with that, um, I think we would want to continue. Um, our first issue would be that we currently are our 180 day calendar is set to expire next Thursday. Um, so I think we would be looking to ex extend that out um, so that there's some time to, to further refine this. Um, I don't know, Ms. Kiefer, is, does your team thought at all about how much time they would like to add um. We, we actually had not, just because we weren't certain which direction things were gonna go this evening. So um, 
why don't, um, if I may suggest, Mr. Chairman, yep. um, if you could, because I know the, the board has a busy calendar, um, suggest what dates you have available in the next, you know, four to eight weeks and then. Sure. Um, so currently we are, the so the dates that we have set certain for things. Um, so we, so next two, so we have hearings on May 18 and May 25 and June 1st. But presently, those are the only dates that we have things firmly booked. So Tuesday the 20th, uh, excuse me, Tuesday the 18th, Tuesday the 25th of May and Tuesday the 1st of June. But beyond that, we are not scheduled. Okay. Um, I, I guess I would, would somewhat put this out um, to, to, to my team as well. So that's, it sounds like what you're saying is that June 8th would then be available for you. It ought to be. Um, I think that'll be available to our board. I would just check with Mr. Haverty if that date works with him. Uni works for me. Um, and for the Thorndike team, may I ask if that works for you? It, it actually, uh, Stephanie, it, it actually doesn't work for me. Okay. Do you want to look at the, either the 10th or the 15th? 10th works for me. Both of those work for me. Art and Gwen? I think the 10th would be good for us also. Thursday, June 10th? Yeah. Does that pose an issue for anyone on the board? Seeing none and hearing none. At what time, Mr. Chairman? Um, so I think we would continue to, we want to continue to Thursday, June 10th at 7.30. But before we do that, we need to extend out our 180 day calendar. That's, that's right. Um, uh, we could do like we did previously and just extend out a short period. So extend that out to um, the 17th or, or the 24th or whatever. We would be fine with okay. that. Um, if I said Friday the 25th of June. That's fine. That would give us a couple of weeks in there to, to sneak in some extra meetings too. Okay, thank you. Okay. So with that, um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon. Could I just do one other thing as we as we go out and do this? The, almost literally, the elephant in the room is what's to be done with the conservation land, and we have not we've not really addressed that. That hasn't really changed since uh, uh, since the last time. Uh, but we're we're down at the end, and it's my hope that the town will uh, engage with the applicant between now and then, and that they can have some useful discussions in light of Mr. Chapdelaine's letter um, that would at least develop that issue for us. Since one way or the other, this is part of the application and we're going to have to address it. Absolutely. Um, let me see if we... 
and know that uh, Ms. Rate needed to leave to go to another meeting. Um, but yeah, I will speak with her in the morning and see if we can try to move forward a little more aggressively on that. And with that, um, yeah, I have a motion to extend the 180 day review period for Thorndike Place to Friday, June 25th, 2021. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Revelak. Um, do a roll call vote, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Chair votes aye. Um, Mr. Hanlon, may I have a motion to continue the hearing on Thorndike Place until Thursday, June 10th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m.? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Revelak. Roll call vote of the board. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. The chair votes aye as well. So we uh, are continued and extended. Um, I believe that includes everything we had on our agenda for this evening. I'd like to thank everyone for their participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Especially, I'd like to thank um, Rick Valarelli, Vincent Lee, and Kelly Lanama for their assistance in preparing for, and Mr. Lee especially for hosting tonight's online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of our proceedings. It is our understanding that the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I move that we adjourn. Second. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Um, are there all board members in favor of adjournment? Please say aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Special thanks to uh, Tina and, uh, and Beta for all your continued work on this project. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.